Hey, Matt Lanfair here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Primary and Secondary Modcast. It's episode 163. Today is September 6, 2018. The topic we're going to be discussing is cognitive load. So basically the idea is we have all this information, all these inputs that, that are coming at us throughout our lives. How do we navigate that? Now let's make it even more interesting. Let's add that to a uh, combat setting. Uh, how that affects the shot process how you do your decision making, um, room clearing, how that affects room clearing. So this is going to be an awesome discussion. We have a wonderful panel for this. We always have great panels. They're always hand selected. They're always finely crafted. This one is especially good. We have some heavy hitters. This is like an all-star cast. Uh, we do have, uh, at least, uh, yeah, we have two more panelists that are due to join us. They're, they're running a bit late. So let's see here. I'm going to just start out with a big, Big thank you to our sponsors. Um, Filster has joined us as a sponsor. If you're not familiar with Filster, they make some very innovative holsters. Um, I wasn't, I, I always heard about Filster. As a matter of fact, a couple years ago, I heard about Filster and thought, well, that's interesting. And I looked at some of their stuff and I got to talking to the owner, John, and I even interviewed him on, on he's been on a couple of other podcasts. And to talk to the design with this guy is really neat because you get an idea of, the process that he goes through when he designs holsters, when he designs equipment, because not only are they doing holsters, but they're also doing um, low profile medical solutions. So for your everyday, everyday carry, he has medical stuff. Medical's kind of an important thing to have. The likelihood of you needing medical is way more than the likelihood of you needing a firearm. So, and obviously with all that, you need training, but Filster's on board with us. Uh, their spotlight holster, Basically, it's it's a very slim design. It's I, I have one for my my Glocks. It works with uh, uh, Glocks with weapon lights. It has a built-in wedge, and I was never a big fan of the wedge until I tried this. When I saw that the the wedge was part of the actual holster, it kind of turned me off, and I was kind of worried, thinking, you know what, I might need to sand that off because I just find wedges uncomfortable due to the geometry of this wedge that's built in, and it's part it's part of the the plastic it's not any foamy or anything like that. It's really comfortable and it works very effectively. His, uh, the claw that he uses is very unique, very low profile and yet very effective. So definitely check out Filster, very innovative equipment. Um, and I happen to know they're always working on improving and there's some, there's some really cool stuff coming out. So wonderful, wonderful guy behind Filster, uh, uh, wonderful businesses that are associated with them. Also, a big thank you to Facts on Firearms. If you're looking for AR-15 parts, barrels, pistol barrels, threaded barrels, Facts on Firearms has most likely what you want. Sadly, I looked today, since I'm issued a Glock, Glock 22, I'm required to have a 40 caliber. They don't have 40 calibers, but that's not in vogue anymore. So no one wants 40. So I'd probably have to special order and it'd be a, it would be a, a one, uh, a, like a one offer. I don't know. It's just, it's just sad. I have to go with 40. Yeah. But Facts on Firearms makes some awesome stuff. If you check on, uh, check out InRange TV, they did this really good series called What Would Stoner Do? They used a Facts on Pencil pro Profile Barrel. It worked very well. So they have all kinds of barrel lengths, gas systems, uh, profiles, you name it. Just a, a good good company to, to check out and, and work with. Lastly, big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. That's what our Patreon, subscribers, uh, Patreon supporters do. They basically subscribe. They, they're, they're donating anywhere from a dollar to you name it monthly. That helps pay the bills. There's a lot to primary and secondary. We have a forum website, all kinds of venues for various media coming out, video, audio, and you name it. Patreon helps pay for all of that stuff. And our Patreon subscribers then get benefits for every tier you, you're you supporting or you're, you're under, you get various benefits. We have, I shouldn't say we, there are about five more, let's see here, there are five shirts on the, on the way and four patch designs. Depending on your level, you might wind up just getting them for free because that's how we have that Patreon set up. So if you're listening to this, you are on Spreaker. If you're watching it or on YouTube, welcome. Uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion. I suspect there are going to be parts of this that people are going to 
they're going to, they're pro hopefully they're going to email me or message me if they want to have this something zeroed in on and used as a separate link and a separate little uh, sound bite. But I really think the discussion that we're going to have tonight is going to be beneficial for the, the casual user, the professional, the military, the law enforcement officer, people that study the mind and the way people react to input. This is going to be a good, good time. So let's see here. Let's do some intros. So yeah, my background's in law enforcement, instructor, patrol, all that kind of stuff. It's been a good time. It's nice to be back. Let's hear from Chuck. Chuck, let's hear from you. Hey, Chuck Pressburg. Um, long, long time listener, first time caller. No, not, not really. Um, yeah, I am uh, here to uh, I'm here to to listen to what some of these guys have got to say about cognitive load and uh, and just kind of throw in my opinion wherever not not necessarily my opinion but my experience uh, where, where where pertinent or where appropriate should be a good should be a good conversation. And so the angle also you'll be able to take with this is actual combat experience in multiple, multiple, uh, events. So that will be, it will be cool to hear your, your take on this and your input on what you've seen, what you've experienced. Good stuff. Yeah, actually, uh, probably as much as, uh, actual, uh, seeing human performance in, <coughs> high stress environments like the battlefield is also going to be uh, the effects of uh, cognitive performance and uh, various vetting processes of organizations and things like that and how uh, subjective assessments of an individual's ability to handle cognitive load are become a critical factor in their uh, selection, their their ultimate, uh, you know, ad uh, acceptance into an organization. So that the, that is one of the things, one of, if not the most important thing that is being, uh, is being looked at when, when we're looking at an individual holistically for uh, their um, suitability, uh, suitability to perform uh, within certain organizations based upon their mission set or whatever. So that, uh, be, you know, be, be prepared for, for that. Cause there, there will, there's definitely an aspect of screening for the right guy, uh, that plays into plays into all of this. So, and, and one more thing to add with what you said, I have a little better idea than probably most of our listeners as to what your background is and what you've been through and that kind of stuff. Knowing that also provides a unique experience because those veterans, the guys that are good at what they do have the ability to assess the people around them and not get caught up in the, so Darcy, being a student at Darcy multiple times, you go through a bunch of times and you stop getting stressed out about it. You do the work, you do what you're supposed to, but then you can pay a little bit more attention to the people around you and your immediate team and slowly fix them if necessary. Um, because you're able to manage your cognitive load. So yeah, hopefully that makes some sense. So let's see here. Ray, how about you? Ray Miller. Former Division Small Arms Master Gunner, the 82nd, currently retired as of Saturday. So now I uh, am uh, doing some contract work in uh, Maryland and uh, just trying to keep it low profile now. Um, still supporting the soldier, just in a different environment. Um, main thing that I've been doing, though, is a little bit of research on cognitive load lately um, in reference to how the soldier does use um, both their their shot process and uh, their enablers how they integrate that and make sure that one doesn't overpower the other 
And like Chuck said, I think what that's going to have to pull in is we're going to have to assess how we screen candidates um, because, you know, being able to rapidly look at a situation and determine which one is priority. Um, yeah, you can do it with training, but at a certain point, you know, picking it up quicker is going to be easier if you screen your applicants a little bit more thoroughly. And so that's that's not a discussion that I'm sure anyone here can have an effect on, but still something to consider. Yeah. Mike. Yeah, Mike Heiser here. Um, used to be an instructor, doing some other stuff right now. Uh, this is kind of a continuation of last week's open mic discussion and um, uh, as an instructor, I've tried to put into play some of the concepts we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, so I'm going to bring some observations um, from my past to illustrate certain concepts that we'll, uh, we'll be talking about here. Cool. Scott? Hey there. Yeah, just to kind of follow up with Mike said, I caught last week's and uh, um, heard this was going to be a continuation of it. And definitely I wanted to get on last week, so it wasn't able to. Um, but so to f I feel, feel like I'll follow up on some of the things that were mentioned there because I think they're going to bleed over into this conversation, obviously. And But more importantly, um, I will not share with you any of my culinary recipes like there was shared last time. Sorry, yeah. not just not going to do it. But I will impart upon everyone listening uh, a lot of those same things we talked they talked about in that last uh, episode specifically with uh, being a constant student you know we're all professional instructors but we're also professional students um, you know and basically um, trying to avoid uh, you know confirmation bias or just be you know becoming so jaded um, through experience that you, you're no longer open-minded a um, couple people and, and if I don't attribute this to the right people. I uh, apologize, but there was a lot of talk about flow, super fluidity, stuff like that were terms that were thrown out. Um, and I think we'll just kind of probably cover that a little bit more, a little bit more depth. I think that's kind of what this whole conversation is about. Um, then lastly, you know, how does this all tie into everything? Not just uh, military, you know, like, you know, selecting people into processes or into units, but also how does this affect you, me, the average person, uh, when it comes to learning any skill, like how do how do people learn to do tasks? Because ultimately, everything we're doing is a task. So um, that was brought up in that last conversation on a couple of different levels by different individuals. And I think this is probably going to be a better in depth look at, and that's what I hope to uh, impart some of my experiences. Um, yes. You know, again, more associated with uh, uh, real world experiences and uh, application, and again, with some of the uh, information I've gained from uh, spending a night or two in the Holiday Inn Express as far as the scientific, not just the, uh, well, you know, I, this is how we used to do it type of uh, answer. There is like some science behind this shit, um, and I've learned a little bit of enough to be dangerous, so I'll share some of that with folks too. Cool. Now, what was your favorite recipe for chicken pot pies? Yeah, bro. You know, that's a secret. <laughs> cool. And, and yeah, background military guy. Oh yeah. Uh, Been there, done 20, that. 20 plus years started off as a, your typical, uh, you know, airborne paratrooper 11 B uh, one SF spent my year, you know, playing time in SF in special mission unit. I uh, was an instructor at the schoolhouse. Um, and again, that's where we'll talk about a lot about how people learn. Um, you had a couple other people on there. I've, I've worked with Mike Green from Green Ops. He and I were instructors together. We saw and uh, developed a lot of the stuff that he and I both do and advocate today based on uh, a lot of those experiences we gained in the schoolhouse teaching people. And I'll, we'll talk more about that later. But uh, did that, did my you know 20 plus, retired, and uh, continued to work for the government, worked at AWG, a couple other places, and uh, con continue to still do uh, stuff on the cutting edge pointy end of the stick type stuff. And you don't look like one of those guys that has 20 years in. Well, it's the skincare. 
exactly it's, it's what all it about is. yeah it's all about the skincare I think there's a famous instructor that's all about that too yeah I'm i don't know comparing it to him i think it's backwards ease and like you know very uh high, stressed out words yeah and we're, we'll things. discuss those yeah all so right go on talk, ask someone else some shit okay i'll ask uh john about his chicken pot pie recipe yeah, I don't got one of those, but I do make some mean Mexican food. But uh, <laughs> my uh, background, 19 years in so far, working on uh, working towards my 20 uh, in the Army. I got the last 11 years instructing. Uh, why this is near and dear to my heart is the, the learning. You know, I, I heard someone once say that there's no such thing as high speed. It's just ownership of the fundamentals or un uh, understanding the basics. And you know, with that in mind, I think that's really going to chime into this conversation um, with just the repetitiveness and doing things. And so how people learn, you know, it's basically what everyone else has hit on. And uh, with my, my passion is instructing. So getting better with that, how can I, how can I inform my students better? And how can I make each individual learn? And, uh, you know, besides just like, hey, this is a weapon or hey, this is how you do something getting working the last six years with our other panelists joe there um has really helped me be a better instructor and in how to perform it from or uh send out information to people and allow them to learn and so that's why i'm really passionate about this mindset and the psychological aspects of um instructing getting the message across and how we can um you know better our people on the ground and military sniper background. Yes, for the last 18 years or so. Yeah. And another guy do doesn't look it. Um, <laughs> you know, bef before we pick on Varg, or before we pick on Joe, Varg just jumped in. We might as well yell at Varg. We're just doing intros right now. Oh, mute. Hey, what's up? How are you? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Do I look distressed? I'm a little distressed. No, you you, you yeah. look you look tan. Yeah, that's Florida, right? Uh, I live on the surface of the sun. So, um, no, I just got back from. Uh, I started. Uh, I found an old school boxing gym, and so I like stepped back in time at the age of 43, and I got my ass handed to me today. Pretty pretty good. I'm gonna sleep pretty damn good tonight. So, yeah. So what's happening? Where are we at? Oh, we're just doing intros. You just came in oh. at the right time. And so, yeah, you just happened to come in. It's like, hey, you know what? And Varg's here and Varg can do his intro. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Varg Freeborn. Uh, run my company, One Life Defense. Uh, history, criminal violence, and violence education. Uh, it's basically work with uh, civilians and cops in lethal force mindset and gunfighting and combatives. And it's going to be interesting to hear your input on some of this, especially with having dealt with the experiences that you've dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, and also on a, on a side note, my understanding is we're getting closer to the audio version of your book, which is exciting. It was submitted. So I'm nice. waiting on them. That's it. Like it's out there. Uh, if I did a good job, then it's going to be boom. It'll be out. I'll, I'll tell everybody, hey, it's available, and uh, that's it, man. Yeah, so it's coming. Are you going to have it available in like five packs, so I can buy a five pack and just <laughs> give it to a bunch of people? Because I'm planning on buying a multiple for friends, yeah. relatives, coworkers. It's actually out of my hands. Uh, I signed a contract with uh, ACX, and they're going to distribute it through iTunes, Amazon, and Audible, and like they've got control of it from there. So they've got That's a really cool. crazy contract. It's like seven freaking years, but they have a monolithic monopoly of epic proportions in the market right now. So hopefully that monopoly holds up for seven years. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Um, the clips that you let people sample last night, was it last night? Yeah. I, all my days are meshing together. The crappy thing about it is I'd listen and I'd get into it and, it'd be, and then it would be like, oh, it's over. I yeah. want more. 
Yeah. Well, that's so good. That's, that's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And cool. the funny thing about recording is when you're recording, uh, people are like, you don't sound the same on podcasts because I'm reading a book and it was like unnatural. I'm like, oh, yeah. So there's this thing and you're like, and you feel all weird. But then by the end of it, I'm like by myself, but I'm back behind a microphone, like blah, 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 blah. And I'm all animated and shit. So the second half of the book is better. <laughs> You didn't record any of that on video, did you? Because that would be that would be fun yeah. to watch. No, no, I didn't get none on video. I, I was thinking after listening to the the four excerpts, I got to hear how funny it would be if you had Patrick Stewart narrate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially talking firsthand violent stuff. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it comes <laughs> out. Cool. Well, let's pick on Joe now since he's here. Oh, well, it's it seems that you're not you're not muted, but you don't have any sound coming through. I think you broke something. Bluetooth turned off. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah, Bluetooth turned off. <laughs> Uh, my name is Joe Flandowski. Um, I'm a performance enhancement consultant and recently, yeah, recently as in the past couple of five, yeah, five, six years, been working with marksmanship in regards to sports psychology. Um, background is in, uh, degrees in, uh, sports psychology and clinical psychology. So basically passion is looking at how people make decisions and how does that affect their behavior and their, their process. So, and I like, I've done both um, working with some forensic populations, but also um, on that side and seeing what decision making is and how, and getting, working with the military, how uh, those decisions need to be quick and how to make them accurate and optimal. Cool. Cool. So I figured it would probably make the most sense for the listeners for us to define certain certain terms. And as we go along, if a new term comes up that might be foreign, we'll probably need to delve into intercepting that immediately and saying, this is what it means quick. Um, right out, let's, let's, let's cover flow state. How would you guys define flow state? And, and I'll just shotgun this out for whoever wants to, whoever wants to uh, respond to that. Well, hey, uh, kind of, if I could, just to make a suggestion, can we kind of pick up where like the last one left off and kind of talk about um like learning the cognitive state learning before we like start probably talking might i see what you're saying set up the definitions of words we're going to use but kind of lead into how people learn a little bit how the brain works and how the muscles oh, work absolutely. and i think oh, yeah. i think that might make this go a little bit more linear and flow a little better well, with, uh, with this specific episode, I, I want to have it completely independent of the, the last one. So people don't need to have, listen to the last one and know what's going on. So this can be its own whatever. So if we have to repeat, perfectly fine. Oh, yeah. Just most I'm, just, info, yeah. I'm just saying because like what they talked about, they didn't explain a lot of that. So if we do that now, I think it, uh, it'll probably like make it easier for everyone to talk a little bit uh, in depth. Just a suggestion, throwing it out so, there. So with that in mind, what is on your mind right now that should be addressed? Well, just... Um, so I mean, obviously, this is we can about delve right into that. So we're gonna we're, the topic here. We're gonna talk about is obviously how how do we perform better in doing the things that we do when under stress or multitasking multiple inputs, both physical uh, and mental, sometimes both. So I mean, I'm thinking let's start off with the brain and describe like you're talking about. The, you were asking like let's define some things. So yeah. the way you know, and if I I'll, I can kick it off if you want. Yeah. So, I mean, the way people learn is uh, obviously there's, it starts in the brain. And again, this is where I'm going to get a little nerdy. Only time I'll probably get nerdy on this, hopefully, is that, um, and this goes back to effective pra practice and how we all get better at doing things. And, you know, that, you know, what is practice? It's a repetition of an action with the goal of improvement. And of course, with that helps us improve. Uh, our performance and do those things with more ease, confidence, speed, whatever uh, the task is. And this is anything. It's not just shooting. This is like tying your shoes, dancing, um, any task, musicians, athletes. Of course, this all happens in the brain and in the neural tissue. And that's with uh, your gray and the white matter. Everyone's heard of those two terms before. 
And just for definition, the gray matter is that stuff that's in your brain that, um, that directs all the signals, all the sensory inputs and stimuli to the nerve cells. And then the white matter is mostly the white uh, fatty tissue and the nerve fibers. And of course, in order for us to move, to do the things that we do, all that info travels from that gray matter down your spinal cord through a chain of nerve fibers that are called axons. And those go to our muscles. Now, how does this all tie into what we do? So if you think of axons are copper wires, and that's where all that information is traveling down uh, in the white matter. And they're wrapped, those axons are wrapped in a, su a substance called like myelin. And think of that as like, you know, the insulator, the copper, you know, it's around every wire, copper wire, and that insulates, uh, it's a sheath that, that protects and, and allows those, that information to travel down those axons. And the more we stimulate these axons and we're practice and repetition, um, the thicker it gets and it allows less energy to bleed off, so, you know, to put it in simpler terms, uh, and allows you to have more effective neural pathways. So the more layers, the greater that insulation around the axon grows. And this, if you want to think of it this way, it forms like basically a super highway for all that information connecting your brain to your muscles. Now, oftentimes, like I think in the past, everyone on this board's probably heard it and used it, the term muscle memory. And what this is, this is the myelination of uh, your neural pathways that gives us our edge with faster and more efficient neural pathways. And of course, we all know that muscles don't have memory. It's physiologically impossible that muscles don't store memory. But that's what everyone over the years has explained is that process I just went through with how axons and myelination and neural pathways are formed in doing everyday tasks all the way through the tasks that we're more kind of concerned with, which is, uh, you know, shoot, move, communicate type tasks. Um, and of course, procedural we, memory. Yeah, I mean, it, it basically you're building up, um, and it used to be we've all probably heard it. You, you ask any of these guys on the board, they could probably tell you, hey, yeah, it takes, uh, you know, since I've been doing this, I've heard different numbers, different hours, like 50,000 reps before something becomes, uh, you know, there's all these numbers over the years and that have been put out, but, um, it's not about the number of hours of practice. It's also about the, the quality and effectiveness of that practice. And of course, when we talk about that, no matter, again, no matter what the task is, uh, effective practice uh, has to be a few things. And that's, it has to be consistent. It has to be intensely focused and it must target the content or your weakness um, that lies at the edge of your current abilities. And if you do that, then you're going to continually build up those uh, that myelin and those neural pathways that are going to allow you to 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 form what everyone has come to you know basically coin as muscle memory. Uh, so the way we do that is you have to have that effective practice and, and way you go about doing that. And some of those things you have to focus at the task at hand, which is kind of a common sense thing, but. Um, that's what, if you're going to do something, that's what you have to focus on and you have to minimize the, any other distractions, whether that's, you know, the phones, computers, uh, anything else you're doing. Um, and then this is again, another one, hopefully we'll slay a, uh, a, a dead horse here. You need to start out slowly or in slow motion. Um, it's because coordination is built with repetitions, whether they're correct or incorrect. Um, if you gradually increase the speed of a, a quality repetition, you have a better chance of doing them correctly without having to think them over time. And this is where, and again, I hope, I'm not hoping I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole with this. This is where the whole, I think, misconception or lack of context and explanation of the term slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So this is where initially I, and I've always understood this concept to come from. Uh, it's just, obviously it's never been, you know, there's huge debates over this in the community, but obviously we're talking about learning something, uh, or practicing something for the first time to learn the correct maneuver. And that's how we're reinforcing that. And that's where the term I believe is correct. Because if you want to talk about, well, no, slow is slow and then fast is fast. If you're talking about learning a skill or you're talking about performing something at a faster speed, two different, you know, buckets, if you want to call it that. So when you use those terms, and I think that's kind of where uh, that 
term slow is smooth is was misused. You know, when I I've heard it and we all probably heard it in different parts of our, our military career or wherever we've been, you know, I learned JMPI sequence and jump master uh, parachutes inspection, uh, the crawl walk run step by step method of teaching. And you went slow and you talked through the talk through method and people went down through that and you learn that and that, and again, that's very slow and you learn consistency because what you're doing there is you're doing correct repetitions. Uh, and you're doing them slow and that builds those mile and the myelin and, and the neural pathways up. Um, but again, just like doing any task, the best way we do that is if they're frequent, uh, the frequent repetitions with a lot of breaks. Um, and that's something you see like a lot of, and I'm sure some of the guys on here, will tell you that do the performance, a lot of top athletes and musicians is they'll do, uh, a lot of these tasks with, at, often 40, you know, 50, 60 hours a day, but they have a lot of breaks in between them and they do other activities related to their craft or whatever it is they're doing. Um, and they'll divide their time into uh, multiple daily practice sessions of limited duration. And this again goes back into something, you know, um, I'll actually, I'll throw it out to Mike Green because, you know, he did get it out, get me into doing it a lot. And I've had students do it a lot and I still do it a lot as, you know, we talk about dry fire. Hey, get up before you put your gun on and, and you go out for the day, do, you know, 30 seconds, one minute of dry fire practice, jam your gun up, fucking go hot, holster it, and then you're on your day. You do those multiple sessions throughout the day, no matter what the task is, but you can do these even though you may not be spending 50, 60 hours. You know, we all have to go out and work and do our regular day jobs. But if you do these tasks in short durations and periods, even though we're a normal person, we can get that practice in and make it effective practice and again build those those neural pathways um and something that helps reinforce that and again this is not like i'm not like pulling this shit out of my ass i didn't come up with this I, this is totally like um stuff that's based in science there's plenty of studies out there that support it i am in no way i i won't even say that myself like i said i'm dangerous i know enough to be dangerous but it's it's backed by science um take that for what it's worth. I mean, you can quantify this. They can replicate and duplicate this. Um, and one of the things that i never was a really, I, I didn't become a big believer in it until I'd actually tried it. And again, you know, being that perpetual student and always opening, having an open mind, I can be again, trying this in other things. Um, and one of the things that, that also helps do, uh, the, does cause the building of neural pathways is visualization. Uh, you know, you vividly imagine this stuff happening in your mind. Um, so as once a physical motion or movement has been established, you've learned it, you can reinforce it by visualizing or imagining it. Um, and the biggest place I've seen some of this done was like when I was, you know, civilian skydiving, people who compete on teams, you'll see them when you're on the flight up on the aircraft, you'll see guys with their eyes closed and they're going through the, you know, they're going through the whole skydive in their mind and they're in the aircraft, they're moving, they're can see their arms their hands moving their heads turning they're looking in the directions they want to go they're going through the whole dive in their mind and visualizing how they're going to perform before they even get out of the aircraft to increase their performance when you know the green light pops and they exit the aircraft um they've done again science they've done studies on this i think um last week someone mentioned something about basketball that kind of and i remembered this in this study they did they took uh 140 some odd basketball players and they divided them into two groups and they basically said hey look we're gonna take group a and you're gonna practice one arm free throws for two weeks and they took group b and all they did had them do was visualization exercises at the end of the two weeks they put all these people back together and they tested them and between the intermediate and uh advanced experienced players in both groups they had both, when they tested them, had both increased or improved nearly the same amount. So again, this goes back to, and I didn't say beginner, I said, you know, intermediate and experience because you have to build um, that coordination, that repetition up to begin with and build the neural, start to build that neural pathway. Once you've got that, you can continue to build upon it through actual physically practicing it. But then in those times when you can't, you can visualize that 
and you you know if you know how the correct motions you can go through that in your mind step by step and they've like I said science they've been able to re replicate this in science so i think you know going back into how do we get to where i think uh Sorry, was it Joe and a couple of these other guys are going to talk about a little bit if I hadn't steal some of their thunder? Or is it this is how you get to where we're going to talk about stuff like flow, super fluidity, uh, con unconscious uh, behaviors and movements? Because that's how it all that's where it starts, and that's how we get to what we're going to talk about. So I feel like I'm kind of hogging the mic here. So I'm going to stop and let everyone else tell me how full of shit I am. Actually, I have a question for Mike. Because I know Mike and I have had this discussion multiple times. So Scott discussed gaining the skills. What about those training scars? Um, yeah. How so, do they affect overall performance? Well, you're, you're trying to acquire, and over a period of time through proper repetitions under guidance and mentorship, you're, you're trying to acquire a certain set of skills or movements or concepts. And if you don't have somebody mentoring you and they don't understand teaching methods, how to structure um, the instructional blocks for maximum efficiency, um, or you're self-directing yourself, you're self-directed teaching, um, you're going to develop what we call bad habits or training scars kind of going back to what he was saying is it's a, it's a matter of good repetitions over a period of time. And he alluded to Gladwell's 10,000 hours, which um, has, is, is under scrutiny. There's some validity to it, but some people disagree with it. And there are ways to compress that concept of you need so many, <coughs> excuse me, so many hours of doing a certain skill properly to uh, achieve mastery. There are ways to compress that. And he, he kind of alluded to it a little bit. Um, you can do some pre-ignition work, uh, visualization, um, greasing the groove. And he, he alluded to that um, when he was discussing what Mike Green was talking about. You know, do your dry fire. You don't have to do it for very long, but, but do it. <clears throat> You're trying to master something. You don't have to lab do laborious work on something. You have to have enough committed time to do good repetitions to start grounding those concepts to develop that heuristic algorithm or schema, um, which is this map in your brain that helps you repeat the skill that you're trying to acquire properly. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The other thing that he mentioned is crawl, walk, run. And, you know, you, you look at sky gods and they're jumping out of planes. They're going to do a bunch of relative work in the air with a big loadout. They do something called dirt diving first. You know, they do it on the ground slowly. They understand where they are in relationship to each other, what their spacing is supposed to be, the order they're going to do a pattern in. They do that on the ground first, multiple times with somebody observing, taking time off to make comments and corrections before they get into a plane, go up pretty high, jump out, spin around, do these cool formations in the air. Uh, th there are lots of components that have to be looked at when it comes to the learning process. Um, and, and eventually, once we've discussed this a bit further, we'll get, in, we'll get into the problem of cognitive load and how that affects the learning process. And there's a bunch of different components of cognitive load and how they can either um, inhibit what you're trying to learn, or if you manage cognitive load appropriately, how you can enhance the learning process as a student and as an instructor, how you can make that instructional block um, uh, more receptive for the student. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because without that good foundation, any, any ability to decision uh, make quality decisions will be ultimately affected. Your performance will be affected if you're practicing wrong, if you're training wrong. The importance of having good quality training is paramount, and that's where it all starts. And then we'll work on other, uh, we'll work further from there. Right. Well, just just to kind of build on something we've been talking about last time and this time is you have to be in an environment with a good instructor or a good cadre or a good mentor or a good sensei or whatever you're your, the person that's teaching you has to be competent themselves. You know, I see a lot of FTOs 
um, out there helping baby cops, you know, in their probationary period that probably shouldn't be cops themselves. And they're imparting bad knowledge to people that don't have what they need to have to get out probation. So they come out of that FTO program with huge training scars, um, which puts them in a precarious position and puts, you know, the community in a precarious position. So it's not just that you have to understand how we teach and how we learn. It's that as a student, you have to go find, you have to do your due diligence and go find good instructors and mentors. Yeah. And as an instructor, you have to be a lifelong student also. We all learn from each other. You know, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. None of this is new. You know, we can tweak it here. Some new science comes out. You know, computer information has allowed us to compress models more rapidly so we can take it out in the field. Um, some things are debunked over time because of, you know, setting up tests and having it peer reviewed. But for the most part, there's nothing new under the sun. So you have to be a good student and you have to be a good instructor in order for this whole process to be effective for everybody in these communities. Good stuff. So yeah, let's, let's get that definition of uh, flow state. Anyone? Joe? Yes. Uh, in regards to flow state, it's basically, um, I think sometimes it's basically almost feeling like an automatic pilot. And if you go back to uh, Chick Set Me High, who wrote the original book, Flow, it was about happiness and also about um, your, your attention, your ability to concentrate when the task allowed for the concentration to be at the same level and you experience that flow state. And also, it took all your attention at that point in time. It didn't take more or less. So basically how people will def define flow is it's some people will say an out-of-body experience, but an automaticity to it. They don't have to think. Decisions come quickly. Um, they almost don't feel in control. They let their body take over. Almost like the muscle memory, but in a way that they almost can really predict. They, they pretty much get out of their own way. And it's almost like a specialized form of being in the zone. And sometimes you're in it, sometimes you're not, but to set up the circumstances to get flow. And the problem is once you realize you're in flow, you tend to, uh, from my experience and also from working with athletes, and it's like you're out of it. Yeah, so. Yeah, self-congratulate yourself. Oh, this is awesome. Look what I'm doing. Oh, crap. Now I'm messing up. <laughs> that goes back to the chasing the wild ox illustration I used last time. Uh, a woman named... Um, Nakamura worked with him uh, when he was studying flow um, and she said there are six factors for that are that have to be encompassing and current um, for experience of flow one is an intense and focused concentration on the present moment so be in the present you know you can't think about the past you can't think about the future it's kind of a, a zen state or mu or you know whatever you want to call it um, second thing is merging of action and awareness. Uh, the third thing was a loss of reflective self-consciousness. So you're not, you're not aware of what you're doing. It's just happening automatically. You're kind of outside yourself. And, and I think I mentioned that with, um, this kid that I watched at a judo tournament in Osaka. If I didn't, I can get back to that later. Um, Another thing she said is a sense of personal control or agency over the situation or activity. Um, the uh, next one is a distortion of temporal experience. One subjective experience of time is altered. That's why you see things in slow motion. You see it happening before it happens kind of thing. Um, Gretzky talked about that quite a bit when he was in that state on the ice. Um, and lastly, the experience of the activity um, is intrinsically rewarding, also referred to as um, autolectic experience. Um, so that's what Nakamura had to say about um, the flow state. 
Um, and she also, wait, one more thing, she also said these aspects can appear independently of each other, but only in combination do they constitute a so-called flow experience. So, and then um, in this article I'm referencing, um, psychology writer Kendra Cherry mentioned three other components um, that should be listed, um, immediate feedback, um, feeling that you have the potential to succeed, and feeling so engrossed in the experience that other feelings and needs become negligible. Cool. How about uh, cognitive load? Anyone want to ta tackle that one? It's the title of the show. Ray? Yeah, sorry. Turn on the mic. All right. So uh, it goes back to the goes back to the 50s where uh, I believe his name was George Miller did his seminal work on you know what the cognitive load was at that point in time it was considered to be your average person could handle seven pieces of information plus or minus two and it's kind of evolved from there I mean it's not just seven pieces of information it's it's how you group them and chunk them and, and process them in your mind so a good definition is just how much information your your mind can handle without um, uh, achieving too much and, and getting that vapor lock or, or uh, you know, seizing. So think of it kind of like your computer that we're using right now for this. It's the random access memory that is, is doing the day-to-day -day operations, so to speak. And then the, the long-term memory is the, the hard drive. Uh, John, am I completely off base there or is that a pretty good analogy? No, I think or you're right on point with, oh yeah, go. <laughs> Either of you. <laughs> Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much that. It's like a lot of times um, there's been different arguments over how memory works. And basically, yes, it is. The computer analogy is very good on that because it is working memory. I've heard seven plus or minus two. It's kind of like why phone numbers have three digits, three digits, and four of what they found out. And when you put that load on you, it's you'll remember certain things when it wants to, and it goes back into for then short-term memory, which is about 30 seconds, then long-term. And by repeating that, you're able to get into long-term. The thing is, if it's something new, um, you have to spend more time thinking about it. If it's older, this is my, from my experience, and it might be from different theories, if it's information that you already have, you're able to access that, and if it's automated, you don't have that load on there anymore. It's like something secondary, just like how the basics of shooting, um, if they have that down and then they go into a new environment, they can take in that other stimuli and work with it. Um, and with that working memory, yeah, it keeps on going back and forth, back and forth. And then if it's totally new and you're thinking about too much, you do overthink and the system kind of crashes and you do kind of freeze. So it, it, Kind of legitimate legitimatizes yeah it makes the it makes the game of the uh, the what if game legitimate because you're already starting some pathways you're already trying to figure out okay if i'm on a traffic stop and the driver does this or a passenger does this you already have an idea of how to respond so it's kind of cheating life i like it it is and then the problem with cognitive load you throw on cognitive dissonance which Things and it was kind of brought up in a way of things that you learned in the past, those training scars, past learning interferes with new learning because your body wants it to be right. It wants to be right. And to get into the pathways, definitely, if your pathways are stronger, and it was just like um, talking about imagery, uh, the one theory is psychoneuromuscular theory, which basically they have hooked up, this is a very old study, a downhill skier with electrodes and tried and had him images run. What's important is what's going to get coded. 
whether it's good or bad. And that brings up, yes, what is good or bad? And um, that is that relationship with your instructor that you have, because your body is going to learn what it does most, whether it's a good habit or bad habit. So that also reinforces the need for an active coach or an active instructor that knows what the hell he's doing and to be able to hit that shock collar when you mess up. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, if you want to use a shock collar, it's good. Um, <laughs> it, that brings up the whole other type of motivation, but uh, if you're into their the own, how they're yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, Matt, before we went hot, you uh, brought up, uh, you know, a topic that, you know, you were doing some dry fire and that you yes. were using, uh, using, um, you know, your own, basically your own opinion of what it was you were doing. So it was very subjective. Yeah. You know, I, I think that we need to just make sure that people understand that, you know, it's, it's like you said, like uh, some of the other panelists have said, you have to pick a good teacher. You have to ensure that you're getting good information input. It's the old adage of garbage in, garbage out is, is still very, very true. And um, when it comes to this, it, it's definitely, there's so much to learn that on the art of learning um, that, you know, I mean, obviously, John, J Joe has developed his whole life, you know, working on helping people to do, to do this. So it's it's definitely something that is challenging. Yeah, it all starts. The baseline is how you're learning it, how it's being applied, how you reinforce it. And I got that's going to determine. Yeah, go. Uh, so so based on my experience. Uh, a couple approaches from a couple of different perspectives. First of all, uh, being a musician and having achieved uh, these these things in, on on the guitar and musical instrument. Uh, second of all, uh, being a fighter and having done having done this both in training and you know achieved flow state and everything in real fights and real high high uh impact situations high stress situations uh and, and i've seen several right so the conclusion that i've come to and, and the way that i approach training is when we're dealing with like cognitive load and flow state and and trying to reach a level of being fluid and being able to assess information coming at you in real time to make good decisions about it right this is what we're really trying to accomplish uh and not be overwhelmed um and it all you know there's things that you can do about not moving faster than you can process things like that but i think the one big thing that i've learned over the years is that conditioning creates the capability to be fluid and and, and to reach that that smooth to fast state um and what i mean by that is you can't just train segmented components like katas and think that you're going to be capable of of flowing through a situation you have got to you you have to condition yourself for the actual movement through the transitions through uh the variables that you'll face so for example um it's like someone who plays guitar they learn chords and you learn songs right and so you can go on there and play 50 songs like a jukebox right but how many guys have i ever played with that can't improvise they can't just if you were like just somebody throw a beat somebody throw down a bass line and let's jam the guys are like i'm out because i don't there's i have no guidelines right but you got guys like me who will step up and just like that's what i want to do i don't want to play fucking everybody else's shit i want to just sit there and let flow what happens and and there's a feeling that goes along with that um and that's done by conditioning yourself so instead of just practicing those chords, you know, I'd condition in a couple of ways. First of all, I'm working these muscles nonstop to be able to move in very unpredictable, um, you know, just uh, uh, immediate cha direction changes, stuff like that. And also I'm practicing phrasings and things of different mixtures so that when the, when the opportunities arise, you might not know it's coming, but when you see it coming, and you hear things fall into place, 
you have these options that just naturally will fall there. Uh, and fighting and fight training is the exact same way. And and having been in a, a quite a few high stress, high yeah, what lethal force incidents, and having done a pretty fair amount of of decent high level training, like CQB procedural level training. Um, when you're at the procedural level, that's when conditioning really comes into play. You can teach a guy, it is, this is what I'm talking about. Instead of learning chords, it's like taking a guy and saying, okay, this is how you open a door, or this is how you walk in and, and, and process a room, or this is how you process a hallway. But he doesn't get his shit together until you make him start at the beginning and open a door, process a room, move through the room, you know, solve problems, move to the next threshold, process a hallway, and then change jobs and move it, you know, so it's the conditioning of of fluid variables that creates the the environment for someone to reach that point where they have, you know, at least the capabilities to enter into a flow state and not over not, you know, even if they don't in, enter into a flow state at least not overload their their cognitive uh, uh, capabilities because they're not moving faster than they can process and the menial tasks the fundamental tasks are not taking up conscious processor speed anymore so what you have is you know you watch guys that go to cqb and they forget how to walk they forget how to open fucking doors they forget how to you know shoot something 15 feet away mechanical offset like all this shit that they know when you put it in segmented isolated components you put them all together and then they start to fall apart on these things so that's i think the prerequisite to you know becoming good at these things at, at least at a procedural level is that you have to condition through this and, and i hate the word use the word but this dynamic type of of um problem solving and and task stacking kind of uh if that makes any sense no that's great stuff yeah i just want to jump in on here yeah, yeah. so nobody wants to admit this but shooting the fucking gun is playing courts it's nothing yeah. more than that that is the that is the fucking level of it because you can't play chords you can't play a fucking song if you can't play a song, you can't improv improvise because you don't have a, anything in your head. So the cool, you know, all the drills we shoot and all the shooting that we do, not even talking about just buying fucking guns, but the shooting that we do is all just chords. It's side alignment, side picture, pressing the trigger without moving the gun. Uh, <clears throat> that's what a lot of people don't want to admit because shooting is, is way up here. They're just like, oh, shooting, shooting, shooting. And that, that's that's not what reality is. When you're on the range and you're just shooting, then, yeah, that's the reality. That's the, that's the most stressful thing that you're doing is trying to shoot a nice little tight group. And that's cool. Everybody loves that. But that doesn't make you a gunfighter. That that just makes you good at shooting groups. And I just wanted to dive right in there following up bar because you know, I just wanted to hit on that because what we're trying to do is get to this flow. We're trying to get to these, be able to do other things. The ultimate thing with shooting is you don't want to be thinking about shooting. You just want to execute and you want to execute obviously accurately because well, this weekend I shot a, a major match in Texas and I wasn't thinking about shooting. I was thinking about my hold. I was thinking about my wind. I was thinking about a tiny ass fucking target. I wasn't thinking about build a good position. You know, none of the old fucking breathing and trigger squeeze bullshit. That's not what I was thinking about. So in combat, I'm not thinking about shooting the fucking gun. It's, hey, I have PID. I need to shoot that motherfucker. The gun comes from wherever it is, and it goes into a position. And if you have good skill sets for shooting, you're just thinking about putting a hole in that fucking guy. You're not thinking about fucking side alignment or any of that fucking bullshit that everybody's Everybody's hung at this fucking low level. And, I, you know, I see these arguments. Where do I put my butt stock? Fucking out, dude. But, sorry. The, that's just what everybody gets hung up on is all the lumens and where my butt stock is. And they don't think about getting into CQB classes. I haven't been to Darcy, but one of these days I go, they don't think about CQB classes. They don't think about shooting multiple targets at multiple ranges. They don't think about shooting moving targets. They just, they got, got this little thing. Sorry for the rant, but it was oh, a good. That was story. awesome. 
Yeah, and it's it's about processing the world and applying your skills to it. Yeah, that's great. And, so, and part of that is because of the reps that you've put in for, you know, that shooting aspect of what we're doing. You've put in all the reps, so you've done it. So you don't have to think about it. Just like you don't have to think about walking. You don't have to think about breathing. Those pathways are built because of the reps you've put in. Your competitors you shoot against necessarily, like they may not have as many reps in as you. So they're still at the fit. Am I, breathe? Am I pulling the trigger? What do my sights look like? you've put in the reps or that's the, that's the point we want to get to, you know, I shoot better when I don't think about shooting, just like you said, because we've done the reps. Now it's processing that rest of the information. So you're able to process information better because you've put in those, you've built those pathways. So, yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about doing the basic reps so that we can move on to processing a room and get into our flow state. Let's go to Mike and then Ray. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what Ash and Varg were kind of driving at is that people tend to do what they want to do. That's fun and exciting and easy. They don't want to um, have to put the time and the repetitions into things that are difficult to, so they can master them, um, push them into unconscious competence. And what happens is, and, and Ash and Varg just kind of touched on this is that um, people become task focused on the thing that they're good at. So you go into a house to clear it or you're doing a stairwell and you haven't done the extra work on the other skills. The only thing you can do is square inch shooting, you know, or, or KD stuff. You, you don't actually understand the, the three dimensionality um, coupled with time that goes into battle space. So, People get when they only have one skill um, or one uh, ability to handle a certain task, um, they become uh, tasks uh, task saturated, or they develop cognitive overload or cognitive overabundance, and they get vapor lock. And we've all seen it as instructors. Guys great on the square range. You throw them in a two man doing you know room to room clears. And they don't have the other skills to go along with their marksmanship skills. And they look, it's clown shoes. It's, you know, it's like watching um, Cirque du Soleil, but with a bunch of monkeys, it doesn't work. So th that goes to the point we're trying to drive at with this conversation is how do you get people to develop more than one skill so that they don't become um, task saturated or develop cognitive uh, load that they can't manage or cognitive overabundance. And that goes to developing um, a training protocol or a pipeline, whatever you want to call it, where the people that are acquiring all the skills they need get enough training for each of those singular skills that they can combine them together, kind of like playing um, a variation on a theme or riffing on a guitar or, you know, uh, deviating from classical drawing to do what Picasso did with cubism. You have to master all the fundamentals before you can deviate from them and enter into that kind of unconscious competence flow state. Chuck? And, uh, oh, go ahead. If I could, uh, just a yeah, if I, uh, oh, segue on what, uh, what, is this, what Mike was just saying there. Is it... Uh, we talked about, I think you actually was you, Mike, that talked about uh, grouping or chunks, chunking in the, in the last episode. It's like yep. you have to build on those skills first. I think even uh, Matt, I think you hit on it like when you're in the car, you're driving and you're, you're, you're trying to drive the car to, a, to a, a possible incident and you're trying to jam on your, your, your laptop there and do multiple things. If you've learned how to do those things in enough with enough repetition in those small groupings, like I learned how to do A to B and I got really good at it to the point where I don't have to think about doing it. And you start grouping them together because I think actually uh, Varg kind of started hitting on this too a little bit is that you, you, you can't just be the masters of those one A to Bs, but you have to be masters at them and be able to tie them all together. And that's where... I think we're, end up, we're starting to go with this and like what you were just uh, we were just talking about there as far as being able to 
do all of those multiple tasks, no matter what your mission or your job is, uh, you have to identify what that is, what your end state or your goal is, and all the subtasks that fall underneath it, you need to become masters at them to where you can unconsciously do them without having, like, like Ash was talking about, think about site alignment, site picture, and all the other smaller steps you've mastered those so you can do them but now it allows you the cognitive we'll say you know you've cleared your ram up and you can think and use that brain power to process the bigger picture like what am i looking at right now in the world in this room to do my job to score the touchdown to play the song whatever it is um and being able to start off and you know like i said master those skills and ash pointed it out it's like yeah well we focuses on the shooting and the shooting and then you get guys like you said that can't do anything in a room or they can't tie them together you have to be able to build uh, a training methodology that allows people to progress in those small chunks but then move seamlessly into combining them and i you know a lot of, it's popular now it's been popular for a while it's like doing scenarios <clears throat> excuse me, and force on force, uh, where, you know, we're applicable, obviously like in our community shooting, but there's other ways you can do that either, whether you're teaching a, a kid to play baseball, um, or someone's learning how to dance or, or to play an instrument. The, yeah, the way I see it is whatever problems you're faced with are essentially a, a, a puzzle. And the more you train, the more those puzzle pieces you have become universal and they can fit whatever problem you're faced with. I, I think Ray had something to say. Uh, Scott hit on it. You know, I was just trying to bring up the analogy. Um, Varg had mentioned it in a previous podcast of, you know, training slow. Um, a lot of people freaking think that that's, you know, counterproductive, but it's like when you learned how to drive, like Scott was saying, you know, if you remember from driver's ed, you didn't just go out there and get on the highway right away. No, you practiced in the parking lot with an instructor until you were very competent at braking the car. And then you would get out there on the road, accelerate, brake, accelerate, brake. So that when it came that time when you weren't paying as much attention as a, you know, new driver, you slammed on the brakes and you were able to stop the car in a reasonable amount of time. But you wouldn't have been able to do that if you hadn't put in the reps prior to very, very similar to building up to that automaticity, which Joe, uh, Joe had referenced earlier. It's that $40 word basically just meaning you're on autopilot, you know? Um, and that's what we're, we're all trying to get at here is how do we achieve that, not with just one task, but with multiple tasks. And, and it's so that we can free up some of that, you know, operating memory that, that cognitive working memory so that we can sit there and devote it to the big picture, like you were saying, and be able to assess our surroundings and be able to say, hey, yeah, this is a good thing or no, <laughs> I, I need help here. One thing with that, that and, and I didn't listen last week and they might have hit on it. The, yeah, building up slow, but you always have, when you're learning how to drive, you always have that understanding of how fast you need to be able to go on the highway. Everybody's been on the fucking highway. You have that understanding about how fast you need to go. The problem with A, instructors that don't demo, which is fucking ridiculous, but instructors that don't demo or somebody's never seen how fast they need to go, they need to at least have that, that thing of where they need to get to because everybody just kind of sticks at this, only move as fast as you can shoot and all this other stuff, and they never see, you know, they don't get guys that, you know, if, if we put Matt and Chuck into a fucking shoot house for a two-man movement, they've seen what fast looks like, and they're able to move fast. But if I don't have what it looks like, I'm just going to creep around the house and I'm going to be doing slow shit. So you have to have a, a at least something in mind of a target that you need to get to for speed when you're practicing. You know, you know with, with the martial arts and with all this other stuff, you see dudes and when the black belts are doing, you know, even if they're just doing katas or warm ups or whatever, when the black belts are doing it, you see how fast they're doing it. You get to see all these other things. So you may not be going that fast, but you need to have something that you're working towards. And that's something that a lot of people forget because they're just like, oh, I'm slow because I suck at it and I'm going to stay slow. But then, then you go to, you know, a match or real world and shit has to happen fast. 
They're just like, well, I've only been drawing a pistol for two days, so I'm going to do a nice, slow, four-point presentation on it. Now that dude's ripping the handgun out, and he doesn't know how to fucking do it because he hasn't ever tried to work fast. So that's just something to uh, to balance. Hey, Chuck, I think it's your turn. I'm going to force you to talk. Yeah, so the the one of the things that – I struggle with when I watch uh, professional organizations that are training on collective tasks is the fact that they cannot ignore collective task training until individual proficiency has been mastered. You just can't do it, you know, especially like let's take SWAT man, for example. Okay. When, when that call out happens, you're showing up with the SWAT team that you have, not the SWAT team that you wish you had. So if I take the first six months of your, you know, 16 hours a month of training, and I do all of those hours on individual weapons mastery, and we don't step foot into a shoot house, if you get called out at any time during that six months, you're a fail. Because your team has got four new guys that just got out of SWAT vetting or whatever, and they haven't even gotten a chance to understand the SOPs of that SWAT team's movement. So you have to do collective tasks. The problem with doing collective tasks is that ingrained in them is horrible, horrible, horrible individual training scars. Uh, I would say Darcy is a prime example. Um, if you go to Darcy level one, you cannot tell me that at the end of that week, every round of simunition paint that was fired in that, in that house was accounted for. That's not the point of that evolution. If you go back and do Darcy live fire, I would submit to you that the footwork and the movement of people in that house is at a different pace and tempo than it was when it was lights out, rock and roll on, hair on fire, pain compliance, free flow. Why though? Why is it different? Why is now that we've introduced shot accountability and real bullets, why all of a sudden are people's feet moving to different paces or at different speeds or doing different stuff or whatever? And I'm not saying that you change Darcy level one and slow everything down and ratchet everything back and like, you really want to go in that house with two D60 mags? Because I'm going to account for every 120 of them motherfuckers. Like, I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm saying there's no free lunch. And you have to know that. You must understand. Uh, there are people that will talk about cognitive load saturation and saying target discrimination early on when people are still trying to figure out sectors of fire and accuracy while moving is cognitive overload. You want to see a bunch of people shoot a bunch of no shoots? Let me do three days of shoot house training where everything is hostile targets. And then unbeknownst to those guys, start covering hands up and removing guns. Man, it'll be a massacre in that house. Because for three days, we have built shitty target identification methodology. They are looking at silhouette. They're looking at scorable area. They're looking at a bunch of things other than hands being the keys to the soul, the windows to the soul. So uh, so I have to be very careful that if I am going to avoid cognitive overload on people, how am I still keeping them honest? What am I doing to, to ensure that they are still going through an integrated act of firing and a decision-making process that leads them to believe that there is a threat target? And maybe I don't start playing catch me, fuck me games right off the bat and start putting bottles of Coke over pistols on cartoon targets in limited uh, visibility environments. Maybe it is like the real easy ones. Double hands, palms out, full cartoon target. That, that target ain't never had a gun on it, right? And maybe I put that target further away in a room where it's not immediately having to be processed once you're trying to dig uh, a corner and, and gain a foothold. And maybe that's the stepping stone between IPSC targets in this house, all the brown ones get burned, all the white ones don't. I, I'm, I'm not sure that that's teaching the right uh, yes. 
there is some cognitive decision making going on, but it's still not reinforcing looking at the hands, which ultimately is what what these soldiers, uh, police officers, or armed citizens need need to be doing. So I have to come up with a target placement, a target selection, and then the right time to integrate that into the process of my of my my training pathway, where they're getting it soon enough that. I'm minimizing the amount of bad training scars that were occurring before that in terms of uh, target identification and discrimination, but not so soon that they're having to figure out, is that a cell phone, a Coke bottle, or uh, you know, a, a burning stick of dynamite on a target that's within three feet of them as soon as they come in and are exposed in the threshold of that room. There, there is a happy medium in there, and there needs to be a learning curve, but don't hold off and hold hold your people's hands for so long that you are now going to have to go back and unlearn them uh, for every every firing iteration uh, controlled pair that they fired in that house for however long you had them before you introduced threat targets. And that's that's a that's a balancing act that every team and every training element has to go through. I see it all the time when I choose to use paint against paper targets, whether that be I have a house that doesn't allow for ballistics or I have a student base uh, that is uh, w that their experience level is unknown to me to the point that uh, I am choosing to conduct live fire with simulated ammo. They put simulated ammo on their weapons and a mental switch is clicking on them and they are in fight or flight mode uh, and they are getting them out there there because it's paint. And and in paint prior to that, it's been force on force, which is whoever gets there first with the most wins, paint compliant, pour it on, you know, get them out there. The, the more, the better, the sooner, the more often. And uh, when I'm asking them to apply marksmanship fundamentals while learning footwork and collapsing sectors of fire with paint, I see shooting cadences that are way too fast for the time space distance. So their firing solutions are completely off. And this can go all the way back to, uh, you know, when, you, when their actual weapon systems changed, when you had either AR teams that were running MP5s with SIMs or nine millimeter upper receivers that either had iron sights or some type of bunk uh, M68 Gen 1 uh, CCO that isn't even bright enough for the lighting conditions, but their duty gun is an EOTech. What, there's something about their setup and how they're running that gun that mentally they are checking out of the marksmanship block and they're getting into the paintball block and uh, and and it shows it shows itself on the targets. They shoot like asshole. They 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 shoot like complete dog shit. I can go to the flat range and they are center punching the X ring, but I hand them a paint gun and I stick them in a house, even though ballistically force on force UTM and five five six FX all maintain CQB level accuracy at CQB distances in a house. It's a proven fact. There is nothing to prevent you from hitting somebody in a tee box with a 5.56 paint munition in a simulated combat environment in, in a shoot house. Uh, but I send them in there with a, with a their duty weapon with paint in it, and they just completely lose their, their freaking mind and and suspend all marksmanship reality they are not acquiring a proper mechanical offset they are literally getting some type of dot somewhere on paper and uh, that paper has got a, a gun knife or other threat and then they're just getting they're, they're just letting them go they're just letting them let them uh uh shoot uh free range in the house so uh we just as instructors we have to be cognizant of what the students are doing and as soon as i see that it's time for it's time for a come to Jesus. The entire class has to get together. There has to be a, a reemphasis on on marksmanship. You know, uh, we talk about uh, marksmanship, and some guys mentioned it. Marksmanship needs to be um, uh, subliminal so that you can be concentrating on the tactical problem solving in a CQB environment. And I and I believe that to a certain extent. That being said, the difference between fight stoppers and dudes that trade bullets for people until somebody loses is that the fight stoppers are the ones that are looking at a dude's dish dash and saying, huh, look, 
he's got one of those red uh, he's got one of those wooden sticks that he uses to scrape the plaque off of his teeth and it's in the breast pocket of his shirt right next to his pack of pine cigarettes yep my eotech reticle is gonna lollipop that stick and i'm gonna start shooting oh by the way while a, a piece of adobe's broken off from the guy's AK fire and I have a laceration under my eye from a near miss. So in real time, while I'm sustaining physical, you know, uh, feedback that I'm being engaged with lethal force, I'm lollipopping a dude's toothbrush in his, in his chest pocket on his shirt. Uh, not, Oh, there's a bad guy. Holy shit. That was close. Um, there's a complete difference uh, there, and it is the dudes that are not staying in the fight. When it is time to aim and end somebody with lethal force, that is the most important thing that you're doing in that tenth of a second or hundredth of a second or, or whatever. And if your firing solution is fast and you can see a firing solution and diagnose I've got that hit all day long. There is no reason why that firing solution needs to take three seconds when you know you can do it in point three, but you are still coming to a firing solution. You are not skipping a firing solution because you're executing a tactical problem at that point, if that makes sense. Let the record show two hours, 25 minutes into the episode, Chuck gave the toothbrush story that will most likely be its own segment. Can I, can I respond to that? Oh, happily, yeah. So, what what Chuck just said is a hundred a hundred percent dead nuts, and and the problem, the the thing I'd like to segue into and kind of come off of that is kind of fits into that like a puzzle piece is the fact that the other part of of over overloading the the cognitive uh, capabilities of someone. Uh, other than getting in and either uh, building in scars or doing moving too fast and they can't process what's coming at them, the other problem is perceptual uh, perceptual stress, right? And so, how do we prepare people? One of the big one of the big problems that instructors have is how do we prepare people to deal with perceptual stress? And what I mean by that is. Um, so if I'm somewhere because of of how many times I've faced situations, if I'm somewhere and a guy, uh, you know, corners me and, and pulls a knife, I'm going to respond very, very fucking differently than the average person who's never done anything. They're going to they're going to see that problem. And like Chuck was talking about how they're coming to a solution. Right. Like I'm developing solutions in in real time. And the average person is stuck in a fucking loop trying to answer questions that they don't have answers for. And then there's a panic that sets in. So their their perception, and I always use this old story about jumping out of fucking airplanes. Like, guys are great, you know, have a great time and think it's big fun and jump out of airplanes. Me, I super fuck that. Like, I'm not, I'm not cool with it. My perception of that problem is that I don't have a solution for that. And so that's that's what it comes down to. So what when the panic sets in and then that that overloads that panic and that spending all that that processor energy on or, or capability on trying to answer these uh questions or dealing with your attachments or worrying about getting your ass shot off or or stabbed or whatever the problem is instead of instead of topping off the guy's uh uh you know pocket right and that's the that's the thing about perceiving perceiving this stress, perceiving it in a fearful situation or coming up with solutions and then, and then executing the solutions. And the problem as instructors is, is getting people to that point. In my opinion, takes, it takes a long time to develop someone to that point. If they've never been into the shit, like you can't, I, you, I can't take somebody. I don't care if I had 20 days straight with them, they're not going to fucking be, you know, it's like, um, you know, you take somebody that's that's been through all kinds of combative training and gunfighting training and all this shit, and you throw something really fucking scary at them, and everything falls apart, right? And it's that perception, that perception of stress and fear, and it's perception, like because there's some guys, like I said, there's guys that you know will face a situation, um, 
Like you throw me downrange with uh, a bunch of Hajis moving, maneuvering on me. I'm fucking out of my territory. I'm going to do the best I can, but I fucking don't know what's really going on there. So, but you put me in a fucking very close space with somebody with a shank and I'm, I'm good. I'm fucking in my own water there. Right. And so it's perception is how, you know, how do we adjust that in training to bring the student to this? So their, so their cognitive capabilities aren't overloaded by this, by this, uh, perception of stress and that causes fear and then they start to get saturated in that and they can't move it's just like what chuck was talking about and and you know in the next step um so when you look at cognitive overload and we're talking about teaching students to acquire skills to manage problems um cognitive overload theory um is broken down into three basic concepts. Um, one is um, intrinsic. Um, that's the difficulty of the skill that you're trying to acquire. So as an example, arithmetic is a lot easier to acquire than uh, calculus. Uh, so as an instructor, if you're trying to teach a certain thing to the student, uh, you have to look at the level of the student to determine where you start them at, what's the baseline, the lowest common denominator. Uh, so intrinsic is, is part of the picture you need to take a look at um, to determine where they are. And, and part of how you do that is you can test them on a standard and then work from there. Uh, another part of developing a lesson plan or teaching students or whatever. Um, the other one is extraneous. And um, that's the load that uh, the instructor creates um, on how they present the instruction material. So as Chuck was kind of alluding to, you have some guys that are, are able to do um, skill A, um, but I'm going to, uh, and they do it well in a certain environment. He's, he's creating an extraneous load on their ability to manage their memory um, and their memory processing by how he structures that training block. So if it's something simple, like let's work on offset drills or let's work on, you know, hammer pair or control pair or failure drills. Um, so we get those dialed in so that they become unconscious competence. So we can do something else. That's kind of a, a low load. That's something that can be managed pretty easily on a square range. Um, but if you take that component and you throw it into a different extraneous load environment like a house or tubular assault or whatnot um it makes the load more difficult for the student even though the skill set is still the same um and then the other one is um germane and that um is the processing um that has to go on to manage developing your heuristic algorithm or your neural pathways or your schema and so you have three things going on and they're additive. So if, if one is easy and the other two are difficult, the student's going to have a hard time processing the information and acquiring the skill. When it comes to um, what Varg was kind of, what Varg was talking about and what Chuck was alluding to, um, how do you inculcate people so they understand and inoculate them for a stress environment? There's a couple ways you can do it. You can throw them in the deep end, hope they don't drown. That's not effective. Um, the other way is something called um, uh, informational scaffolding, which is where you um, have little helper components in your training block. And over a period of repetitions and time, you slowly start pulling those helper blocks, that scaffolding away from their training. So it's that crawl, walk, run thing again, where we're going to do this, but this safety measure is going to be in place until I see that everybody's on board with the program and they can put the rounds where they need to be um, while other things are going on in the environment. And then the next time you go through um, the house, the setup's the same, but you take away another reinforcing scaffolding component. Um, you're taking away basically the training wheels each time you do a different set of repetitions or run throughs. Um, and, and that, that, leads into something we'll talk about later 
which is chunking versus stacking when it comes to repetitions. And that's, um, you know, one set versus uh, subsets within a set and how that affects um, your ability to process information and take it from short-term memory and uh, process it and capture it and keep it in long-term memory. So Varga, I don't know if that answers your question, but those are some concepts. Yeah, I think that, I mean, and I threw that out there kind of like, I mean, I know how I approach it and it's, you know, I just threw that out there as a way to like, what, how, what does the panel think about that? Like, you know, what, where, what are we doing as instructors and as, you know, people who are designing or thinking about these problems for bringing people up to speed, what are we doing to accomplish that? So I think, yeah, that was, that was excellent. Well, uh, response. To one of the problems yeah. is just really quick. One of the problems is it depends on your target audience, who you're contracted out to um, your chain of command, the, um, the, uh, the, the corporate um, mindset for safety or risk aversion, how you can write up your lesson plans and what your goals are to teach your students. You know, some people are so risk averse that you can't teach them anything except the bare fundamentals. And then you have to, you know, cut them loose to go out in the wild, as Chuck was saying with the SWAT example, and you're doing everybody a disservice. Um, so as instructors, you know, when you're developing POIs and lesson plans, you have to really take into account how you're, what the methodology is that you're going to incorporate to get people to actually absorb this information, process it, and then um, integrate it in such a fashion that it becomes unconscious competence. A lot of instructors or departments or agencies, you know, they just go for the little boilerplate instructional plan and POIs and call it good. And that's not satisfactory in my opinion. Yeah, to kind of round out what, uh, what Chuck started with in Varg, and then of course Mike, um, you know, give kind of an example of that is I think how, how do you we were identified what the problem is? Is it how do we build that PO and how do we do that? And one of the things that I kind of learned um, over the years, and and I can't remember exactly where I heard it from, so I can't attribute it to it, who it came from or where, but. When you're introducing new ideas, concepts, or equipment to people, it's a uh, general rule of thumb is no more than three, three new things to that person. I would even argue to say in some cases, no more than one. And, and I'll use myself as a good example. So plenty of experience uh, being an assault force sergeant major, running two radios, working with the, the, the ground force commander in the rooms. We're, we're doing a, a company size hit. We're taking down multiple buildings, multiple times. Have no problem running two radios, sometimes three radios, directing people to go places. Have that shit wired down tight along with all of the shoot move stuff. So introduce a new widget. I got this new widget on my chest, you know, kind of like a little Android type of device with like, some software in there that does some cool shit. I can see all this. I like, I got like a ton of fucking information now. Um, got to play with it a little bit before, you know, I put it on and used it, but not enough to where I would say that we are talking about where we have all talked about is gaining competency or unconscious, uh, ability to operate it without having to think about the processes. I still had to think about it put back in that situation. I got this device on, I pop it down. Like I've done this a million times. Should I do it? I start looking at this device, trying to get a little bit of information but because I've not gained the mastery unconsciously with this and the, the confidence in it. It took me a little bit out of my, my own. So again, how do we look at where I'm going with this is how do we build our mastery of, as instructors of introducing this stuff? And I would say that until you assess a student and understand where and other people have touched on this, what that person's ability, Chuck t touched on it perfectly with like guys, you just trust in the room with nothing but paint. Some dudes, you're still going to glass house. Them. Once you understand where your students are at and what they're, what they're working with and what you're working with and what they're capable of accomplishing unconsciously, that new task, you may be able to only give that group or that person one task, depending on, it, you know, the complexity of what it is you're introducing to them, whether it's equipment, concept, or or any type of skill. Or it might be something, someone that's a little bit faster, that grasps things right away. And it's going to differ. And, and another classic example, um, going back to when I was an instructor, Mike Green and I, 
on the range. We ran uh, 24 classes a, a year, and we had everything from, uh, you know, military members, but sometimes even their spouses and their children, 16 and up. Different. We had to gauge the the person and, and how to focus it on them. But more importantly, you will get people that are like, switch the fuck on. Um, case in point, we had a couple, and it was this was fairly consistent too, because we had a couple uh, commanders or captains of nuclear submarines come through our course, you know, and that's what their job was. And there, all those Navy dudes, all those sub dudes, are a little fucking weird. I'll just say that right up front. I don't know what it is, but they're just fucking weirdos, man. But every one of them that was, you know, they were the captain in charge of the fucking sub. Those dudes would come in, and when it was whether it was the driving portion, the shooting portion, anything that had we had to do physically with those dudes, you would, you could take those guys and you could tell them do A, B, C, and D just like this. Show them how to do it, and they would fucking do it to perfection. Like they are the anomaly. But again, you know, there there's a reason why they're in nuclear subs. And Chuck kind of touched on this earlier about selecting people and determining aptitudes to do certain skills those dudes were picked out to do that and of course with guys like that as an instructor whether you're in the car with them or you're shooting it was a really easy day because you'd go i need you to do this this and this this is why we do it this way here's how and now watch me do it boom 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 and they would get in and they would do it and they would almost like i said to the t do it perfectly now flip 180 from that you get the guy who uh brings you know has comes down he's got bad habits training scars or you've got uh, a young wife it's never done this stuff before you have to back off on some of those tasks and again how do we deal with identifying cognitive overload and then determining where we need to adjust it and that's like again as instructors we have to be able to make those calls but more importantly we need to look at the, our pois uh how we structure them and how we structure the course or what we're teaching um, in order to achieve that tour, we're not throwing seven tasks that they're completely unfamiliar with or not even uh, competent in the basic level with and expect them to compound or learn something new on top of it. And that's kind of hard to do because you have to step back from your training and you know look at your training methodology and assess it of, yeah, this POI might work for groups A and B, but group C, this POI is nowhere near or this method of attacking this this problem is nowhere near the right way to do it oh before we go to something else joe are you are you still with us yes <laughs> okay. uh, yeah i was um thinking about that one of the big things about that tension with that overload um you gotta look at what they're trying what as we become expert and elite with things you know what to look for and what that extraneous information is. And a lot of times I think, I know speaking with me and working with other ones, everything's going so fast in the instructor's mind, they forget to tell, oh, the simple basic of what are you assuming they should know or what are they going for? Because once there's that extraneous to say, this is really important to focus on, you can then tell them, hey, this is, this is good. This is what you don't want to focus on. And also then the student themselves, like talking about uh, the submarine captains, it's like they've probably learned their own learning style and they know what they need to pay attention to um, or how they pick up that material. And it's kind of like if you um, talk to my wife, she used to fence as like getting conversations of what makes a good fencer or a good sword fighter compared to somebody who isn't. And is there a perception of, what they pay attention to and the older ones are already three or four moves ahead they might not be as fast but they can be the that intelligence overpowers that youth that just charge right in and they're already thinking of what they need to focus on and what what move they're going to do to counter it and then go to the perception part if you don't perceive that you can deal with the situation or if it's totally new yes um, it's going to be hard for you but by having the routine, sometimes I've seen people, yeah, just like in practice, training, they're great. As soon as you put them on 
something live or that game time, everything switches because their perception and they don't trust what their training was. They don't trust their performance routine or their shot routine. And it's like, that's where that comfort comes from is that routine because you know, you can do it. Now it's the new situation is a new situation really going to affect you. No, but that's why you also add that into the training to make it that real part. Because if it's not real, if they don't take it seriously, they're not going to then process that information and they're going to do basically bad habits, lazy training. Uh, one of the ways you can flip the, the script on uh, as an instructor on your students is to use uh, the Socratic method. You know, there's a gross tendency for people as, inst or as instructors when they're instructing students or teaching any skill set to bark out information, tell them this is what we're going to do, do a live demonstration, you know, cover the safety concerns, um, maybe give um, an anecdote or an illustration. Um, but when it comes to getting people to switch their mind on, sometimes it's valuable to let them um, kind of teach the class themselves. And I don't mean get up there and, you know, take over, but hey, what do you think about this? Why is this a good idea or why is this a bad idea? Or how would you approach problem solving this issue? Uh, because it makes everybody go, hmm, I hadn't thought of that. Or, wow, I didn't realize I'm not looking at it the right way. And sometimes as instructors, you get answers that are very valuable for you because you didn't look at it from that perspective. And that may change how you're going to do your POI for the day with that group of people that came in that you're on contract for, that you're, they're paying for your time or that you're, you know, you're part of your uh, organization or agency and that's your job is to teach them their, their 40 hours a month or whatever. Um, so sometimes using Socratic methods is a valuable tool um, because it changes the perspective for everybody in the teaching learning environment. Ray, you had something? Yeah, so I wanted to touch on something Scott had brought up about the uh, the whole integration of technology. Um, and that kind of ties in with uh, a concept of cognitive tunneling. And, and basically all that is is an extreme form of, uh, you know, trade-off between your display that you're looking at and the surroundings. Um, so you're focused in on that one thing for whatever reason. In, in familiarity, uh, just trying to figure out what it is you're looking at, whatever the case may be, you tunnel in on that one thing, and we've all seen it um, in various scenarios. And my question for the group is, you know, what do you see as being good ways of preventing that from happening um, with multiple things? Because we all have in, in our various applications we all have various things calling for our attention whether it be a radio whether it be uh, uh, you know the uh, system that uh, scott mentioned whether it be heck even a cell phone all these things are calling for our attention so how do we maintain that focus um ray just a quick concept or, or thought on that uh john spencer um, wrote a pretty good article called Putting Concepts of Future Warfare to the Test. And he did a study with uh, cadets at West Point through the uh, Modern Warfare Institute and, and dug into um, young troops, kids, you know, students, and how they embrace new technology um, to fight in the battle space. And uh, um, it was written in, let me see, uh, March, April, 2018. Um, and uh, the, the results were kind of surprising because they're young kids and you think that with all these millennials jumping on and playing Call of Duty and Rainbow Six and stuff, that they'd be able to manipulate a bunch of different uh, um, variables uh, in real time in a battle space and be proficient. And the, the results of the study that they did say, yep, yeah, that's not happening. And um, it's because they uh, are getting so much cognitive overload that they're dumping 
the VR headsets that they were using in this test to go back to sketching things out on maps or doing approaches to villas or, you know, locations um, in order to get ISR as opposed to using the, the better tools um, that allowed them to have some standoff distance and actually collect more information. Um, so and if you get a chance, you might want to take a look at that article. Um, it was uh, uh, John Spencer um, and uh, Brandon Thomas uh, of the U.S. Army wrote that article. Um, so when you start introducing a bunch of new variables into the equation, um, if you're looking at how you do instructional methodology, before you can introduce those components, they have to be dialed into every other thing in their skill sets before you hand that off. Just like um, somebody else was saying a little while ago, you, know, you get this new doodad, how many of those new doodads can you throw at some guys and have them um, soak up the knowledge and become proficient? Well, you know, it's, I can uh, do a, I can open up a three inch fire hose on a group of students and they're going to get, you know, washed away uh, and not get hydrated. Or I can turn on a garden hose and just have a little trickle and they can handle that and they can get hydrated. And, and that's, that same concept applies to taking information in, um, putting it in short-term memory, and then eventually through good repetitions, transitioning it into long-term memory. Uh, there's, there's no easy solution in my opinion. You just have to, you know, do the, do the rigorous work and um, set up an environment where, A, you selected good candidates, um, you have good students, um, as an instructor, you know who the lowest common denominator may be and adjust your POI for that. But in the end, everybody has to walk out of that class with a certain set of um, skills and a level of competency so they can go on and do their job. It, it's, there's no easy answer because there are institutional barriers um, to accomplishing those goals. I mean, that, that all you know, does sum it up pretty good. I think that the challenge that I see is for our average uh, soldier out there or, or NCO out there trying to teach his soldiers or uh, average uh, police officer out there just trying to, if it's, a, uh, I'm not too familiar with the term, but a training officer, something along the lines of that, if they're trying to actually effectively teach their, their people, uh, you know, just making sure that they, they understand the importance of that good input. Uh, I mean, I think the analogy kind of just goes back to, uh, you know, your MOA. It expands as it increases in distance. And if a small incremental change at the beginning can make a huge impact further downstream. So making sure that they're getting good information as an input and then getting the good reps, I think will help to decrease the amount of time it takes to develop past the efficiency into that mastery level. Well, we can, let's go back to Gladwell because that popped up early on in the, in the, the cast, you know, Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell posited the theory that you need 10,000 hours of repetition in order to attain, attain mastery of a, of a skill. Um, and again, I've, I've mentioned that some people call that not, not right. Uh, some people still, um, believe in what Cladwell has posited, um, regardless of whether you agree with them or not, there are a couple things you can do to compress um, the time it takes to acquire a skill. Uh, let's just take um, making ready, right? Um, making ready on the line, square range, you're making ready. You're getting your primary and secondary weapons up ready to fight, whatever, do the drill, whatever you're getting ready to do on the line. If you make ready with the pistol the same way every single time, and then make ready with the rifle the same way every single time, or the shotgun, or whatever you're running, right? Every time you do it, you reinforce that skill set. It's administrative. We're not actually doing anything, but if, if and instructors know what I'm talking about, you see people kind of do it half-assed because they, they know it's administrative. If you do it like you're really getting ready to do your fucking job and you create that that pathway in your head, that schema, that, that heuristic algorithm, you're, you're, 
you're doing, you're priming the pump or greasing the groove. So every time I make ready, I'm doing it like it's the real thing. I'm getting ready to go into that shoot house. I'm getting ready to go do something important. I don't administratively do it. I don't administratively take a magazine out of my holster or out of my pistol when it's still in the holster and reassert a new one. That's fucking sloppy and lazy and it creates training scars, right? That's compressing. So, you know, and then when you, when you make ready, right, actually do a good draw stroke, you know, get rid of your attention devices, do a proper draw stroke, have a good stance. Every single time you get up on the line, or you're getting ready to go into a structure to do your work. Do it the same way every single time. That's priming that pump. That's greasing that groove. And, and instructors that let students get away with sloppy uh, mindset, just with that small little thing, aren't doing uh, the students any favors. It's like your stance, you know, your, your martial stance, your combat stance. As much as you can, it should be almost the same for everything that you do. I see people that are so bladed on shotgun versus their pistol and their rifle, they have to learn two or three different stances and manipulations to do those skills. If they're basically all the same, every time you do rifle, you're doing pistol. Every time you're doing pistol, you're doing shotgun. That's compressing that 10,000 hours pretty quickly. And then we, we can talk about it a little bit later if you want to talk about you know stacking versus chunking. That's another way you compress that Gladwell 10,000 hours of mastery concept. So... I think that uh, when you're talking about the introduction of new technology specifically to, to, to speak to your question, Ray, um, it's a free for all when you're doing a new fielding to a new group of people because there are no best, best practices. Um, as soon as you get some type of institutional knowledge, you can rapidly help uh, somebody with a new widget. So um, let's talk about ENVG. Probably wouldn't take me too many nights of executing night vision stuff for me to figure out that when I'm in a static position or when I'm on an approach to somewhere that I've probably got my thermal channel turned up pretty high to cue me to somebody laying in wait or to cue me to somebody maneuvering in the underlying folds of the earth within my sector, right? But I also know, I because I figured it out because I played with the ENVG, that the thermal channel covers up the resolution of the I square when it's turned up too high, and now I potentially have got a target discrimination problem. So when you hand a private an ENVG, you can tell him those very basic concepts like, hey, man, uh, if you need to see whether you should shoot somebody, you need to turn your channel down. If you are looking to see if there's somebody out there, you need to turn your channel up. And then intuitively, you're know, like, hey, Joe, like, unless we're down in the tunnel system underground in zero light, you probably have no use for your thermal channel in the house. It's only going to be sensory overload to you as you're trying to process and engage targets uh, within the structure. So, uh Prior to making entry, just like you used to flip the cap off your white light back in the day, you need to be buzzing the thermal channel to, to zero and running near IR only going into the house. That's very simple, very hard learned. You know, the first month or so that guys had EMVGs and nobody had ever had a fuse channel on their face, those probably weren't common sense things. But, uh, when you have eight guys that got it and one new guy that don't, it's very easy to cross that over. With the same argument could be made about going to a, to chest-mounted Android. When you have all this new information, you got to sort through uh, just like gamers that have adjustable HUD on their game. All right, do I need Minimap? Do I need Reticle? Do I need uh, Auto Compass? Um, do I need, you know, all these other indicators and high-level gamers are going to pare down the information they don't need, even though they're operating at a really high cognitive level, they're just going to get rid of it and put it in the background. If I have a device that's giving me situational awareness about adjacent units, when I'm inside of a house fighting, I'm probably not going to reference that information. It's just not germane to the, to the 
the individual and collective tasks that I'm accomplishing at that moment. Now, if I'm firing weapon systems that have a kinetic shoot-through effect, or I'm going to blow something up, and I need to kind of do a virtual backstop check and be like, all right, man, before I fire a Gustav down this hallway, is there anybody hanging out on the on the south side of Building 5? Um, then, then all of a sudden that essay becomes much more important. And that's what I was talking about, um, scanning with your weapon and, and doing marksmanship kind of related tasks can be third in precedent as you're working your footwork and breaking your sector of fire down. But once you identify the AK-47, you made the decision, I'm going to apply lethal fires. Now, all of a sudden, my 30 millimeters of, of essay of the entire universe becomes infinitely more important than any other things that I'm doing right now to include where my feet are going uh, at, at that particular moment. So I'm shuffling to the foreground and background what I'm paying attention to cognitively in, in real time. And, uh, and, and, you know, this goes back to something that Ash said all the way back at the beginning, like, hey, man, shooting is strumming the guitar, but if you don't have some type of context to put that in, it's just strumming the damn guitar. So I think that people that are um, proficient in uh, ground tactical operations are going to have a much faster learning curve taking on a new gadget at a time than somebody that's trying to figure out how to operate as part of a team in a tactical environment and what damn setting their nods should be on. So anything that we can do in terms of capturing best practices and, and lessons learned, we get asked all these funky night vision questions. What Which nod tube do you put your compass on and why? And uh, uh, monocular, left eye or right eye, why? Uh, do you rotate one eye up and leave one eye down on 31s when you enter a structure, why? Uh, these are all best practice uh, suggestions that have come up, and some of that is going to be based on individual preference, and some of that is going to be, you know, legitimate. Hey, it's been proven that if you are strong eye dominant, if you have strong eye dominance, placing your monocular on your non-firing eye so that your lazy ass doesn't have to flip up your nods when you go in a room is a bad way to fucking conduct an approach to a target. The chances of you falling in a hole, compromising everybody, and hurting yourself are exponentially higher because you are failing at the walk through the woods in the dark stage. You haven't even gotten into the ninja white light to IR transition in the gunfight in the house stage. So perhaps you should stop overthinking uh, what is the best way to shoulder your rifle with your nods down and focus on what's the best way to walk with your damn nods in your face and not fall in a ditch. That's, that's kind of my, my thought on it. Oh, I, I agree. Um, with you there, Chuck. But one thing also, though, is that we have this tendency, or some people have this tendency to believe that all these new widgets are going to make um, the soldier or the police officer that much more proficient because of all these capabilities that they bring to the, the fight, so to speak. But the problem is, is it doesn't matter how intuitive you make the system, if you don't take the time to train with them, in in a structured path, so I've got my weapons training going on over here, I've got my widget training going on over here, and then marry it, and like Ash was saying, have a, a demonstration of this is what right looks like, this is what you should be shooting for, this is your, your standard that you should be going for. If you don't have that structured path, then they just wander. And the challenge is, is how to make sure that they know what right looks like and know how to integrate all that and that's that's what i'm seeing from from my end and it's not going to get any easier um, in fact it's probably just going to get more challenging the the problem in your world is that after a piece of equipment is fielded there is an assumption at all levels of command both the material developers that are fielding and the maneuver unit commanders that are determining doctrine and whatever there is an assumption that whatever you feel the soldier is uh being used in accordance with how it was designed and it's functional and present in in the formations and that those are huge 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 assumptions uh then after somebody gets shot you say well 
Why, how did that person get shot? How did we have a blue on blue? We have whatever widget that was designed to prevent that. And it's like, <laughs> oh, you're on the assumption that everybody actually wears that bullshit. Nobody's wearing that bullshit. And, um, you know, ENVGs, I could give you the best POI for best practices in the world. Nobody's running the thermal channel on the ENVGs, not because they don't have best practices, because they don't have batteries. And if they want their nods to go all night long, they're not going to turn the thermal channel on. So I could tell them when to have the thermal on and when not to if they don't have the battery life to be able to get through a cycle of darkness without uh, without going black, they're not going to turn it on because they want green screen till the sun comes up. And and that is the problem that the maneuver center and the uh, material developers have never understood. They get they do their little funky labs and their little limited developmental testing uh, sterile ranges, and they just think they got the answer for everything and that that's how – it's going to look in the force and nobody ever goes down to the force and watches a large package week and like stands in the alpha alpha as the colonel peo and grabs every paratrooper coming into the alpha alpha when they're dropping off their shoot and saying hey stud is your thermal on right now <laughs> fuck who the fuck are you no it ain't on i ain't got no batteries you know like if that dude was in that alpha alpha and he got that that real no shit snapshot and realized oh my god we have 2,000 EMVGs and four paratroopers running an actual thermal channel. We probably uh, don't have a thermal dismounted capability that we think we have right now. But that, that's just, it's not happening, man. It's not happening. But it breathes well on paper. Yep. So I got a question. So we talk about all this overload of information and all this stuff. So as instructors, how do we battle that uh, when we're training? We, we talk about doing reps and things like that and uh i think joe has some good ideas uh that i've worked with him if he wanted to chime in on some of that stuff if that's a place yeah. at. no um what i was thinking a lot is going back to what right looks like in that um what is relevant and what is irrelevant in regards to what needs to be paid atten paid attention to because that is like you have to tell that person that and also to go back to with that um, cognitive load on it, as you're as you're paying attention to not just what you need to attend to, also where is your focus? You want to look at it. Um, best way that was uh, Nidifer. He came up with the model of attention. He has two axes. He has broad to narrow. So pretty much think about if you play video games or before you even look on your rifle and the optics you have a very broad view of the space around you. Narrow is as you turn up the power, looking at an optic, then looking at a spotting scope until you narrow it down. The other part on the other axis that makes up the quadrants is internal to external. And basically by each quadrant, each style of focus is going to affect you. And when you're talking about switching about, hey, who do I need to pay attention to what other units are you doing or if I have to pay attention to what's happening right here, right now in the house, you are going through these quadrants. So when you're broad and external, you're taking in that information. And then you're quickly moving to an analysis where you're broad internal and analyzing that information you took in. And then taking action is when you go back outside external and go narrow, and that's taking that action. And the last one is a rehearsal where it's narrow internal, where you're going over what's going on and assessing what's then going back to assessment to see what happened. And you're flowing through this process in split seconds because your focus of taking in information, when it works right, you have a fluid motion. And where it turns wrong is when you get stuck in a certain point, such as if you're taking the information and you get stuck in this information overload. You're stuck in looking at everything that's outside you in a broad perspective. And on the other side, if you're going narrow external, you're getting that tunnel vision. Basically, when you get stuck, you're sometimes not seeing the, the woods through the trees. And that almost goes through, if you have that uh, knowledge of the tactic, but you don't have the knowledge of what's going on around, the reason why. To go back to music, it's like 
you know the song, but you don't know the theory behind it. And knowing the theory behind it, you're going to be able to apply and see why you do that. And if you don't know why you're doing that, you're just doing it because that's what's done. So you can't change it up. So by moving in between these with this focus, you have to know when you do get stuck. And it's really what is going to be relevant at the time, what's irrelevant. Because if you can't choose that and you don't know what right looks like of what you should be paying attention to or move your focus so you analyze when you need to analyze and take action when you need to take action, you're going to use up that system. It's basically like opening up 50 applications on your phone at once or all this new equipment and you're losing that fundamental of what is this supposed to do and not understanding that and how it's applied. Uh, so makes, how, do, how do we practice on the internal, external? I mean, it seems like there'd be some simple drills just to practice going through on that chart. Because I remember the chart just, just you know, throw some stuff out there that we can practice on on moving around in that, and so we know what that what those holes feels like, and we know where our personal divots are because everybody's got one. We get we get hooked on something, so you know, you know just some stuff like that. Um. Yeah, I know in, when we were going through ARMIC, um, we would do number grids. It's a random number grid, and basically somebody would call out a number, and you would cite it in. So you're going from looking at your weapon, first of all, finding the number, then citing your weapon on the number, and then letting you know when it got there. So switching that around, that was one way. That's a simple way. Um, some of it is starting off not just at the line firing your weapon, as I know, Ash, you're saying, firing the weapon, fire the weapon at a known range, but starting all the way back before you even get up to the line of what needs to be paid attention, paid attention to. And it's basically looking like also slowing it down. Okay, I know um, John has done it. It's like, okay, what do you observe out there? What do you see? Now bring it back in and analyze it and slowing it down say, what is important there that you need to analyze? And he'll correct if it's not something there. And then going, okay, taking action. Sometimes taking action is the easiest thing. It could be just pulling the trigger. Um, and to cycle through that or simple examples like driving a car. What do you need to pay attention to here? What do you need to pay attention to there? I don't know if that's answering your question or not. No, that, that, that's right on it. I mean, it just, you know, people, people uh, think about that sort of stuff and they hear it and they're like, yeah, that sounds great, Joe, but what do I need to, to do to, to work myself through there? So what, mm -hmm. what Joe was talking about is we had the guys and they would, they would drop down in a prone position and Joe and his crew made this big ass chart it was the number chart because we had to we had to play with sizes, um, but it, it was the random number and it was whatever number, you know, that they called. You had to start there and you had to find all those things and you had to sight in like you were going to shoot it. So it was basically forcing you from going from that external to that internal to that external, and then you had to, you had to go internal a little bit to figure out what number you were on. And then some people, the mass was hard. Forty three comes after forty four. You know that that was kind of hard. They start they start forgetting what those numbers were, and you know just some things like that. And you can do it with anything. You know when you're visualizing or you're doing dry fire, you're going from external to internal. You're going from looking where the target's at to going to sites. You know, and that, that's just that's just way to to practice that stuff. Yeah, definitely, and made me think of um, also that internal to external. And then we'd give um, sometimes math problems or something else to throw on to it, like how many innings are in a baseball game or in a playoff, in a baseball playoff. And adding on to that load and saying, hey, you put them under stress. And then your self talk comes into it. It's like, I don't know what uh, that, how many are in the series. I don't watch baseball. I don't watch hockey. Or simple of how many, um, two plus two. When you're put under that stress, they might not think about it, and all of a sudden they get in their head and saying, instead of being outside their head of, um, hey, um, 
it should be two plus two equals four, they go out and say start going even deeper in their head and ruminate. Um, I don't know what that is. Why are, I can't find it. And then add on also instead of staying internal and doing the math, they will then go. Oh, I'm hearing somebody else already called out the number and found it. Why am I aren't, aren't I finding it? Instead of being okay, what do I need to do to find that number to be that external narrow and looking for it? So is there techniques and tricks into finding or like when I realize that I'm on cognitive overload or as an instructor, I see that a, sold, a, uh, a student is being overloaded with information, how do we cue them to focus back on the simple task at hand? Uh, for, first of all, they, uh, when you see it happen, somebody might, they might not even know that it's occurring. And if they don't know and have that awareness, just simply say, hey, what's going on here? Stop, what's going on? And then after that stop, it's like, what do you cue them back into? What is it that you need to focus on at this point in time? Because that's going to change throughout and go, even take a deep breath because if they're stressed out and they're not thinking or they're thinking, but they're thinking too fast, hey, what do you need to focus on in this situation? What do you need to focus on before, um, before you even lay down behind the weapon and go in the prone position? What is that prone position? And going back almost to that shot process, that routine of what do I have to do? What are those steps to get me into that zone? And some it's like, okay, first I have to feel loose. Okay. Then I check my weapon and go through my checklist. I lay down. I make sure I have mag mags certain places before you even go there. And almost that routine becomes a reset, whatever that is for you. But you as an instructor, you might not, you might assume, and there's certain things that I've assumed certain times. It's like, hey, did you even zero your weapon at first? If they did that, or what are you thinking about right now before you shoot? And asking those questions, because a lot of times they don't even know. You're almost making an assumption that they do know, or it seems so simple that it gets thrown in the back because you're used to doing it. And meeting them where they're at and going down and saying, hey, what's important at this point? What's important at this point? And they might look at you like you're, you have four heads because you're asking the simple question, but to get them to repeat that process because that's what's making it successful. It's that small thing they're usually missing. So, and also different cues for themselves. With that cue, um, it tell, it's that instruction. It could be, for me, I know I shoot longbow. I know it's it's not a it's not a rifle, but very similar in it in that I have to do certain things since I shoot longbow with no sights. So I have to tell myself a full draw, an anchor point, so I can aim from the exact same point every time. And then with that, that adds on to of hey, telling yourself exactly what you do because if you say don't don't miss a target don't miss a target or you're saying to yourself um i hope i just hit the target guess what it's that you're not setting yourself up for the success you're not telling yourself exactly what you need to do and fundamental fundamentally it can be boring the brain can get tired and it doesn't want to because those aren't the sexy things about what can be done that's not the cool stuff it's like you have to set that base and then build off it. And when you're training, yeah, meeting where they're at and adding on those tasks. So you can then get that fluid motion, but you have to then have that reason behind it. Um, something else to consider, John, since you asked the question, as an instructor, uh, sometimes you see a student or a group of students struggling with something that they were doing well earlier and um, you have to take a forced cognitive pause in the curriculum and allow them to <clears throat> kind of let their mind uh, unwind, so to speak. Um, and that kind of goes to what I was talking about <clears throat> earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
with uh, chunking versus stacking. So if you have a bunch of students out there and they're working on um, controlled pairs at 25 meters and um, they do well for a period of time and, and as an instructor, a mentor, you're watching their progression and you see them drop off, uh, you can stop what you're doing and make corrections to, to their errors, whatever they may be. A lot of instructors um, by design, because they don't know any better, or because that's the prescribed POI for the agency unit, what have you, um, they have to get through a certain instruction block in a certain amount of hours within a certain amount of days. And they push that POI really hard so they can check that box and sign everybody off. The problem with that is that not everybody's on the same page or has the same level of skill. And as a good instructor, you have to be cognizant of that. So what happens is you'll have instructors go out there and say, we're going to do 50 repetitions of this drill. And you've got, as an example, got a square range, got guys on the 15 meter line, and they're going to do 50 repetitions of hammer pairs. And you only have so many people in the cadre to watch all the students and look at all the paper. Where in that 50 repetitions did they fuck up? I don't know. Nobody else knows, right? You can't make a correction if you can't observe it. If you don't measure it, you can't change it. That's stacking. We do a shit ton of repetitions to get the repetitions done. That's how we used to do free throws, blah, blah, blah. And there was no actual guidance or mentorship involved. That's one big set of repetitions. Some of them may be good. Some of them may be bad but you don't know where those bad ones occurred because you can't put eyes on everybody in the class. It's not possible unless you're running cameras and take the time to look at the video and, and, and nobody has time for that shit. It's not, a, it's not feasible. The other way to approach training people is to do subsets within a set and each subset builds a, works on a certain skill. And the next subset is a reinforcement of the skill with possibly one more addition of training. As an example, uh, let's work 15 meters on a square range. You're working hammer pairs. You do 10 repetitions, make everybody safe. You go up to the target, you evaluate the targets, make corrections for each shooter. Hey, you're still shooting low left. Consider this, right? That's that cognitive pause. That's a Socratic method. Hey, why are you shooting low left? What do you think is going on here? And then you send that first relay back, and they jam eggs and hydrate and urinate and whatever they're going to do. Second relay comes up, do the same same drill. You know, hammer pairs at 15 meters on the line. Same process process occurs. You go up, evaluate the targets when they're done, make same corrective mentoring uh, adjustments. You bring the first relay back, and instead of hammer pairs, you're going to do failure drills at 15 meters. So they're still working on their hammer pair, but now they're adding one more component that brain shot and you do the same process. So you're reinforcing the first subset with the second subset. And then you go through the same process, make them safe, evaluate their targets, give them corrective measures, maybe ask them why they did what they did or why do you think this is happening? How would you change what you're doing? What was going on? What were you thinking? And then you bring the second relay on and you do the same drill. The third drill the third subset is going back to the first subset, hammer pairs. So you're going back and forth, you're flip-flopping back and forth between all these old things that you're doing. So you're giving them confidence in their skills. You're giving them time to think about what they're doing and process it because there are fewer repetitions as opposed to a fuck ton of repetitions that you can't diagnose, which is fucking horrendous instruction. Uh, is that, does that help, John? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, question was, you know, addressed to the group for our podcast listeners here, you know, uh, absolutely. That I mean, that's like the way that we like to train um, regarding having people, you got to change it up, giving them time to think. I know like when I work a lot on the range with Joe, uh, I work primarily long gun stuff. That's my background is all long gunning. Um, so we're very, you know, slow, methodical shot, blah, blah, blah. And I always, Joe's line is, you know, he talks to the instructor or talks to the students like, Hey, how did, how did you feel during that particular shot? Because, you know, 
snipers like to feel good when they make a shot or if they didn't make a shot, how did that make you feel? You know, so definitely one of the tick, one of the other tricks that I like to use for them building that is I will have, when I'm doing these big train ups for competitions, you know, it's day in day out every day for like three months, they're on the range Monday through Friday, every single day, you know, they write in their um, journal logs, how they felt that particular day, what was going on in their mindset to really find that, um, that focus on how they performed well and what allowed that to, I know that's not necessarily, you know, cognitive overload stuff, but like the techniques used for, you know, why did you perform well that day? If you only go to the range every once a month or every two weeks and you only shoot for a day, you know, you might not necessarily have a bad range day, but anyone that knows that you go to the range for extended period of times, you're going to have a bad range day. And it's because there's other stuff that is overwhelming your performance, whether it's a wife at home or you didn't get chow in the morning or, you know, any of these external factors that you're concentrating on instead of the task at hand. So being able to uh, drive that focus back onto how can I focus? How can I get a good rep? Um, like I'd mentioned before, like I, I shoot better when I am not paying attention to shooting in the aspect of, I tell people I shoot better when I'm fucking off. Um, and how do I get back to that phase? You know, when I'm working in a sniper team, my guy used to tell me like my, my key, my cue word was pineapple. And I know it's like a, it's a silly term, but when I was able to, when he said that, cause he'd see me getting overwhelmed, that was my cue word to focus on the task at hand and get back to what I'm doing. Cause he would see that I am on overload uh, and that I wasn't concentrating or I needed to, back out a little bit and just do what I have trained to do for so long. So I'm going to jump in right here. Yeah. The, uh, so we just want to lead Joe into something, but I'm going to hit Varg with it first. Um, and then Chuck, you can jump in on it and everybody else can jump in on it whenever. But so one of the things that, that Joe talks about was energy management. So when you're nice and fresh, and everything's good and you, you had everything and you're nice and calm and you're in your Zen moment and you're hyped up on your hate breed or whatever it is. Uh, and you have your performance zone where you perform the best. And if you don't have something like that, you should start figuring out where you, where you perform the best, whether it's after 13 cups of coffee or whatever it is. Uh, but if, if I'm not managing my energy use well, then I'm going to start to fall apart. So something that wasn't overloading me here, once my energy starts burning out, is going to start overloading me. So, Varg, if you're tracking with that, if you could dive in on managing your mental energy through a fight. And then, Joe, if you could follow up on anything that, that Varg misses, I think that'd be a, be a really cool thing to, to manage that. Like, I'm not cognitively overloaded right now. Everything's going great but I've been burning the candle at both ends for however long it's been two rooms, one room, half a room, whatever. And then, or, you know, throughout the fight and then, you know, how to, how to keep that going. <laughs> so, um, I can point to a couple of, I won't get into specifics, but a couple of, uh, uh memorable, um, situations in my past where, uh, there was some retribution or some aftermath of fights that happened immediately after. So uh, there was already, you know, some pretty high level engagement that had happened and it got into some pretty heavy duty shit. And then immediately there, there was, um, you know, multiple guys coming in, in uh, for vengeance on, on what had just happened. So you thrown immediately into another fight uh, and this happened multiple times, at least a couple of times. Um, in one of those instances, I was stabbed on the second run through. Uh, so the, the situation that, 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 you know, retrospectively looking at this and, and through years of trying to think, okay, how can I help people deal with something like that? Um, it, for me, the management of energy can't be, you can't fully depend on that. You can't, 
you know, it's good to know where your performance niche is, but there's going to, there's going to be a day when you're, when you're depleted and you have to fight and you need to have an answer for that. And there's, so what I try to do, there's, there's like that, that moment of saturation or diminishing returns where people are training and they just, they're just falling apart and they're not getting it anymore. And it's the point where most people would say, you know what, let's call it a day. You're, you're diminishing returns. You're not fucking, you're falling apart. You're not hitting targets anymore. That's when I pull people together. And I say, listen, uh, you know, you got, nobody goes a hundred percent. Nobody goes a hundred percent. You haven't won a hundred percent. You still have something in you pull your shit together, put it back together and perform one last time so we can get off the range on a good note or, or get out of the gym or get off the mat on a good note. And, uh, and I think it's those little tiny things that, that help build that resilience so that when you reach that point where you're burned out or you've been fighting or you're on the, the 10th room or the third floor or the, the fifth guy and you're, you're not at your peak performance level anymore, but you have to pull it out. And so the perception of, uh, well, you know, conditioning, right? Where's your conditioning, your PT, all that shit. You should be able to last, right? When I go to the gym, I, I want to do 40 rounds, uh, you know, and instead of 15. Um, and so that kind of stuff helps you out, but managing it really comes down to a decision. I think, uh, and at, at a certain point, physically, you're just going to fall apart. Um, but I think people tend to, especially people who have not been tested uh, uh, very heavily, they tend to fall apart way sooner than they actually have to. And I think if we can just get that concept across to people that, listen, you have a lot more in you. You, you, have, you have more performance in you. And I think it's a decision. Uh, to not deteriorate at a certain point. Uh, I think people mentally decide to deteriorate before they actually deteriorate, if that makes any sense. And that's been my experience is that um, times when I was pushed into a, into a bad situation after being wiped out already, I had to st you, you step up to the fucking plate. Like, this is it. Uh, here we go again, right? And you step up and you do the thing. Um, Eventually, you're going to get, you know, eventually you're going to run out of gas. But the point, I think, is, is that people perceive they run out of gas before they actually do. I don't know what's fully behind that scientifically, but I know that that is the case. And I watch it happen in training and in fighting. I don't know if that answered that, but. Yep. Hey, yeah, yeah, you're right on it. And then, uh, so, Joe, whenever you, whenever you want to, when Scott gets done, because he jumped on. Just uh, just follow up with that uber smart guy stuff that you got. Uh, yeah, hey. that, that, that is um, with how if you look at your energy level basically as a battery and also getting your zone, um, the theory behind it is what we call the inverted U. Take a basic bell curve, okay? Put on the x-axis arousal level and on the y-axis your performance. So as you go up on the U, uh, inverted U, upside down, as your arousal level goes from pretty much, think about sleeping, all the way to totally freaking out, uh, maybe you had six Red Bulls, smoking a cigarette, and a dip in your mouth. On that continuum, each, as your arousal level goes up, your performance is going to peak at a certain level. That's going to be your optimal performance. After that, after you over-rev, almost like an engine, like... Uh, if you're in second gear and you're redlining it, is your engine doing a lot of work? Yes. Is it doing a lot of work that's being put out to go 20 miles an hour? No. So you get to know where you get that diminished return from. And you can beat yourself or psychologically quit before you uh, physically quit. And that's another topic well stuff on the inverted U. So for each task you have, you have that peak. That peak shifts. So it, say if you're reading an article on marksmanship or the mental side of marksmanship, you're probably going to have that you switch a little to the right at a lower level. You're going to peak. 
Um, you're not going to want to expend that much energy. And even if you're excited about the article, if you're all excited and go, hey, I want to read this article. This is really cool. Guess what? You're probably not going to sit down and read that article because you're too amped up. Then for other tasks, you might want to have a little bit more energy of where that peaks, such as if you're either going to clear a room or if you're going on a rock march, yeah, that energy level is going to be a little higher. The thing is, it is that subjective level for you. And you have to determine what does it feel like, and it's called the individual zone of optimal functioning. And it's individual because it's individual for that person and also individual for um, that task at hand that you have. And you have to start going through and saying, hey, just like John was saying, what is feeling good? What is in your zone? What does it feel like both mentally and physically? For And then also, what is too much? What is too apt? And on the other side, what is too little? And know those indicators. Because you still have, even if you only have 35% left in the tank, you have to use that most efficiently. And the thing is, the body reacts to a mental stressor the same way it reacts to a physical stressor. It does not know the difference. So you get that fight or flight. So if you miss the target and you're on a, just on a range, is that target going to kill you? Is that paper target going to jump off the wall and hurt you? Probably not unless you're taking some drugs. We're hoping you that's not happening at that point in time. Good if it's all <laughs> So and So, but the body's going to react the same way. And to manage that energy of, hey, where do I need to be? And through a deliberate breath, through um, cue words of calm yourself down, like John was talking about with pineapple. And then on top of that, what you add on, you're, you might not be operating alone. Some of that will be experienced, uh, that I've experienced, it's like, as in with the snipers, the, spot, the sniper team, they have different levels of optimal activation for themselves, that optimal level for performance. And... They don't know that they're different. One's like that really low, really mellow. Other ones almost at like an eight or nine, listen to death metal. And they're trying to get each other up to or down to their level. And guess what? That screws up the other person. So basically by only expending the amount of energy you need, you can save later on. Okay. And, and, Correct me if I'm wrong, but that comes through efficiency, right? Joe? Um, could you repeat that? So, being able to conserve your energy comes through um, acquiring efficiency in a skill set or, or, or a task, right? So, mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. if, if there are inefficiencies, you tend to bleed energy Right. And you and you dwell on the inefficiencies as opposed to the efficiencies. Correct. Yeah, you definitely can. Because dwelling takes mental and also when it's something that you're not as competent in or you don't have that feel of confidence or learned it. Yeah, you're going to have to spend more mental energy to go through it because you're thinking about more of what you have to do. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, frenetic movement or even thought. And to answer kind of like John's question, um, early on, uh, Mike, you mentioned, um, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of other people that have come before this, just to kind of go back to like we are talking about uh, studies, things that are, people have done this before us. Um, one of the benefits of being a multi-generation military uh, family is I've had uh, some exposure to a, a pro, a, it was a program, it was a project, it was called the Trojan Warrior Project. 10th group ran it back in like 1985 and that was a holistic approach to like everything we're talking about here uh it, it dealt with um meditation it dealt with pt it dealt with aikido it uh they did a bunch of a gamut of things to basically try to develop a better warrior it also kind of jokingly became known as the, the jedi program in uh, within group amongst group members uh, also didn't help that it had a a flying, you know, Trojan horse, because that's part of 10th group's heritage up there. And two crossed uh, what looked like lightsabers and then had basically in Latin what translated to may the force be with you. Um, but it was a legitimate program. And it was, they ran that in uh, like in 85. It, 
that program ran, and then they ran one at Camp McCall a little bit after that. They tried to replicate it. Um, and even before that, um, some people have probably heard of Michael Enchanis. They've brought him out, and they kind of did the whole martial arts philosophy type you know, aspect, or again, a holistic approach to that. And that it's been tried. There's a book. They wrote a book out. If people are really interested in that, it's called uh, In Search of the Warrior Spirit. Um, again, it was uh, very early on. I'm not saying I ascribe to that like 100% because some of it did seem a little bit far out at the time, but it was probably the early, earliest look that we had at uh, doing what you're talking about as far as controlling the mind and understanding how the mind and the body works together and talking back to what Varg was talking about. Anyone who's been through any type of selection process in the military has been exposed to that portion where you find a group of people and you test, you know, you have to figure out or where your your line is and, and people will either they think in their mind where that line is but when they're physically pushed to that point they will find that there is also you know there's more in the tank than they thought about especially when it's like life or death and or uh the consequences or something that maybe it's meant to like i i, I don't want to fail because i'll have to go back to my unit and everyone will know I failed. There's motivators. You mentioned that earlier, Joseph. There's, so there's motivators there, whether it's you know the difference between life or death or failure or success. Those are usually probably the two biggest ones. What people will it'll drive people beyond where they think they like. Well, you know, they'll go a little bit further. And then John, like, and I guess even Ash, when you're asking about it, like early on, I mentioned that in order to have effective practice, you have to have one of the things was. Um, lack of distractions and that you had to practice at the edge of one's abilities and when you when you start to combine people being tired or worn out uh, or pushed both physically and mentally you're working at the edge of one's abilities uh, and then distractions that whole again with that Trojan warrior program project they were they worked on calming the mind they worked on meditation and some of the other programs that came after that they dealt with that meditation part so to answer, you know, John's questions, like, how do we do this? Well, you think about it when you've been on the line and you're behind the gun and you're in that zone, you're starting to go into that flow. And you're like, you're, you're, everything's clicking. What, what is really going through your mind? You're not thinking about anything. At least I'm not. I mean, from my experience, when people, when they start to go into the zone, you're not really thinking, you might be doing what you're doing, but then you start going through motions that you're familiar with, whether they're physical or mentally. And, the next thing in it, it's just, it's unconscious. It's completely unconscious, and you enter that zone where you're not thinking about anything, and that I think is the biggest thing that, that detracts from like even students or even ourselves teaching stuff is that if you're thinking about what you're doing, you're not doing it well, and stopping and calming your mind. And the thoughts that cause those distractions, like whether it's like, hey, man, the wife was bitching at me. I didn't take the garbage out this morning. That's not what's important right now. If you're behind the gun and your focus is to, to put a round downrange and hit the target, that is where you need to be like, you know, be in the now. Um, and I hate to kind of use this example, but I think it's something most people relate to is everyone's seen the Matrix. Neo's fighting Morpheus. And they're all doing, and then it goes back to like knowing chords and being able to do and, and free flow. More, you know, he's got all those programs. He's using all those fighting styles to fight Morpheus and he's not able to beat him. And then finally he's like, stop thinking about hitting me and just hit me. And then what happens after that? Okay. So he calmed his mind and he stopped thinking about what it was he was trying to do and was able to control all the distractions and focus. And that's really what, what brings us into how to deal with cognitive overload and, and achieve flow, or at least an optimal training state is you have to remove as much of the distractors externally, whether that's blocking out the sounds, the explosions, whatever it is that are distracting you from that task or internally, man, I got to get home and, and, and cut the fucking grass or I got to, you know, whatever internal problem you think about. When you can put, push those to the side and focus on the task at hand, be in the now of what it is you're doing, you will achieve optimal performance and or maybe even inner flow, enter the zone. Over. All right. Um, I, I wanted to jump in on what the last couple guys uh, just said. Um, you know, my, my colleague earlier 
uh, referenced, you know, that he used to live that life where he was running two radios and he was in charge of multiple maneuver elements. And that's one of those environments where it's really easy to become task saturated just because of the amount of responsibility, the amount of decisions that you have to make and the amount of uh, information, auditory and visual that is being like dumped on you at one time. So those of you guys that have heard me talk about the no fail shot and about uh, basic firing solutions in general, I have said that I would take self-awareness over proficiency any day when it comes to shooting people, uh, especially when, when innocents are, are on the line. So uh, that applies to cognitive overload. You need to know what the physical and psychological tells are that you are running in the red. You have to know that, and that is on an individual case-by-case -case basis. And then you just need to divest yourself of the information that is causing overload. So rather than just saying these big nebulous things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my colleague's example of being a two-radio guy. All right, so I'm a, plat let's say, platoon sergeant. Uh, on a target, right? I'm running two radios. One radio is talking on the assault net. One radio is on the communications net. And I run into a room and my medic is on a knee and he's working on one of my guys who has got a gunshot wound to the leg. Simultaneous with getting this information, I'm also determining that the target is in fact becoming secure. I've got squad leaders chirping in on the radio, giving me status of men, weapons, and equipment. Uh, where locations are at, their squad leaders calling out on the net, trying to find their lost guys that have run off with other squads in the free flow. Uh, my, I'm separated from my counterpart, uh, the officer. He is, uh, he is in a, uh, another location on the objective where he can best control what's going on outside of the target. And then I have multiple um, ISR or, or uh, other platforms outside of the target that are all trying to give me information all in real time. So uh, there's some things that I can do to set myself up for success. Prior to that, uh, one of those things is understand how I process auditory information. There are push to talks that allow you to use a single Peltor type system with one cable, and then it wise out and it goes into two radios. The uh, good part of that is that it is streamlined on your gear. The bad part of that is that both radios come in to both ears and one talks over the top of the other in, in that scenario. Okay, I determine that to not be good for me because a lot of times people that I'm talking to on the assault net are also on the command net. So if the boss calls me and he wants to know something about whatever and I go to respond to him, I don't know if the officer called me on my assault net or on my command net because it's the same dude's voice coming in to, to, to my Peltors. Everybody tracking? So I preferred to use dual comms Peltors with two pigtails to where the radio on my left hip only broadcast into my left ear and the radio on my right hip only broadcast into my right ear. So I'm, I'm making equipment choices based off of how I process information so that I can multitask better. And all of that has been done through trial and error prior to ending up in this shit show in the southwest corner of Building 16 on the ground level where we have a hasty uh, established casualty collection point going on. So the next thing I can do is if I determine that the radio traffic that I'm hearing is not germane or just it might be the most important stuff in the world, it's just too much, is I can unplug. And if I think that the information that's being put out is so important that I can't miss it, I could task somebody else to listen for me. I could turn to somebody else in the room that has access to one of those radio nets and say, I'm going off assault for the next five minutes. Do not bother me with any radio traffic unless you're telling me that there's an element counterattacking building 16 right now. And then click, I unplug that, that pigtail and I get beautiful, glorious silence in one ear. And now I only have to listen to the other radio. And if it's still too much, I could pull that pigtail too. And now I'm listening to no radios because I need to know, best guess from Doc, how long is it going to take to package this guy and what the risk is as far as bringing in air. Can we hump him off the objective or do I need to start looking at LZs right there on the objective area?
It's the difference between me having to call in fire support, having to potentially clear other buildings on the far side of the LZ. There, there are multiple second, third order effects that all have to happen in, in short order. But I need information to make a decision. So I'm getting rid of it, erroneous information that is not going to help me make the next decision. And then I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Doc. Doc, what is the status of this guy? He is litter. Okay. Now in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, now I got to get litter bears down here. Um, he's urgent, so we probably need to bring him out on one of the assault aircraft and not a medevac bird. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at the dude, and he's a big guy. He's, you know, 200-plus dude, and he happened to have the quickie saw. Great. So uh, I need to probably make this a short LZ as opposed to a far LZ. Now I'm done talking to Doc. I can plug back in a radio. I could start talking to people that are in charge of other enablers. I could start bringing on other equipment. Uh, I can ask Doc to do other things on my behalf. Doc, yell out in the hallway, get third squad staged in the hall. Tell them I need three guys to help you with litter, and I need the rest of the squad prepared to pull security on the way out to the LZ. And all of these things are happening, but instead of happening all at once, I'm breaking them down into bite-sized pieces because – at the fundamental level, I know what I can handle and what I can't. And when my body and when my heart rate, when my respiration, when my stress, all of the things that je ne sais quoi stress is hitting me and I am panicked to the point of indecision, I'm not superhuman. And I have to make decisions one at a time in a sequential and logical order. I don't need to be calling... AC-130s to cover the LZ if I don't even know what LZ I'm going on. I don't need to be calling three squads down for aid and litter if the guy can walk out on his own power buddy assisted. So I can't panic and start initiating movement thinking that I'm helping before I've even informed myself of the decision that I have to make at that time. So there's a there's multiple things that are working in, in synergy together for me to deal with the task overload that's been presented me. Um, and that is preparation of my equipment to help me process information. That's the decision when to unplug. And and then there, there may even be some SOP stuff that's thrown in there. But regardless of whether there's SOPs or not, regardless of whether I can turn my radios off or not, you know, if I can't unplug my radio, I can take my headset off if I have to. I can totally remove my helmet and headset and throw it across the room if I have to stop all of that information to get right and get out of that panic red zone and back into a functional area where I can I can start to, to talk and uh, communicate and make those decisions that all of those people are counting on me to make. And when you think about just just the simple matter of I'm kneeling facing the dude and I'm watching his arterial spray hit the wall, maybe just turning the fuck around while I'm trying to make a decision and removing the visual thing of a friend and a subordinate that I'm responsible for and watching that dude bleed out while I'm trying to save his life. Maybe just removing him from my field of view is just another load that's been taken off my plate that can get me back down into that functional band to be able to perform. And, but it all starts with y'all. Before you have SOPs and equipment setups and everything, you need to know how much of a shit sandwich you can take until the wheels are going to fall off. And that's why dudes love Darcy. And that's why dudes love Ranger School and all of that crap. Because you might not stress yourself out to find out what you're learning, what, what your limit is or what you think your limit is, but you're never going to break those glass ceilings until somebody or some external stimulus is forcing you to break those glass ceilings. And, uh, and, and, you know, as, as been said, I won't hammer on it too much more about, you know, you can go much further physically than you think you can, whether that be in a fight, it's life or death or or otherwise but you need to come up with those mental tricks uh to keep your body physically into the game those of us that have ever rocked on fort bragg uh we understand the concept of running telephone poles you know you're going to run if you're trying to get a good time you're going to run until you're physically smoked and you might take a, bre a break and then you might run some more but eventually fatigue is going to come over and you are not going to spur yourself to to run anymore. And so uh, 
moving by telephone pole gives you a visual cue that you can mentally work yourself up to like, all right, man, when I pass this telephone pole, I'm going to start running again. And, and if it's in the middle of the ruck and I still have 30% juice left, maybe I run two telephone poles and then I walk between one telephone pole to catch my break. But as fatigue overcomes my body and I, and I, I just, I can't get my heart rate back down and I'm still running in the red. Maybe it's a one-to-one ratio. Maybe by the end of the ruck on an 18 miler, I'm walking two telephone pole lengths and only shuffling one. So I went from run two, rest one to run one, rest one, to rest two, run one. And I'm throttling myself, but I'm giving myself an external stimuli and a program finish point. So I'm talking myself. I'm, 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 uh, I'm bargaining with my body. My body's like, nope, I'm done. My, I got blisters. I'm cramping up. I'm about to vomit. My heart rate's up about 168, 170. Uh, you know, I'm starting to see the wizard. Come on, man. It's only one telephone pole link. That's literally that's literally 40 yards, bro. You got 40 yards in you. And if you don't do that, you are going to go to a shuffle, and then your walking speed, ground speed, is going to decrease, 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 and then you're not going to make time because you never got yourself mentally to light a fire under your ass with achievable bite-sized goals to stay in the fight, or in this case, the ruck, uh, cognitively, if that makes sense. The, those of you laughing that have been on either Chicken or Manchester Road, please feel free to comment. I think that makes perfect sense, Chuck, in that you're, you're just breaking it down, like you said, into that fundamental level of, you know, what can I do in the moment? Um, I think the challenge, once again, though, is how do we consistently get that across our organization? And I think that just comes back into, like you were saying, you, you've got to make it to where they're pushing the levels across the board, which comes into tough, realistic training and enforcing the standards. Where have we heard that before? I think that, you know, one, one good point, I mean, multiple good points by both Chuck and Scott, where they're talking about being able to multitask, being able to multitask with everything they got going on. It's because they've put in all those reps, you know, growing up in the military and being able to, you know, when you started off, you know, when, when Scott started off, he didn't have, he didn't start off as a PFC running two radios. You know, he started off maybe as an RTO and working one radio with the commander yelling in his ear and then he's relaying information. And so he built those steps and now he's able to take information from a commander and all that. So, kind of like what all that rolls into is going back to what we were talking about, that unconscious competency is because, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you and I don't think about just walking, you know, how much when we get into uh, instructing and stuff like that, wh where we don't tell the soldiers that, or the people that they need to stand up from the bleachers by planting both your feet. Now walk to the range. You're going to walk by, stepping forward and placing your heel on the ground and rolling forward and shift your weight. We know that that is a base foundation. And so all these advanced skills that we get into, what we want end state is the ability to unconsciously perform a task to X standard, whatever that is. And so the more we practice these skills that we expect of ourselves and of our students is the end, we have to do the reps and we have to do them well so that we can perform them unconsciously. We need to consciously perform them to a high level of standard so that when it comes down to the time, we don't have to think about that task, running two radios, clearing a room, uh, taking a corner, putting a controlled pair, making that 800 meter shot, calling the win, whatever we got to do. We just don't even think about those tasks because we've, in our training element, we've done that. We've learned how to conserve our energy. You know, everything that we've talked about, we don't have to think about. And so I, I would say the end state to our listeners that are paying attention to this is that there is no shortcut to it. There is no book answer to, hey, um, 
uh, cognitive overload. You mitigate cognitive overload by in our training and going through training and making sure that as you're doing it, you are a professional student and that you are putting in the time and doing the self-centered focus on what you're training at that time. So when it comes down to doing it real world, when the bullets are being exchanged or whatever the task is, that we're not thinking about it. A um, couple things. People talk about what we've been talking about, cognitive overload and suffering and dealing with stressors and whatnot. Uh, as an instructor dealing with students, um, sometimes, and this was brought up earlier, sometimes you have to be aware that people aren't on board. And, and one of the things that um, some people, some instructors, some students aren't aware of is that occasionally uh, you have to um, de-escalate your training just a bit because they have other things going on in their life. Um, you can see it in their body position, their stance, their demeanor, um, how they answer questions, their effectiveness on a target, um, how they move through a house, uh, whatnot. Um, there are variables other than what you're teaching them that contribute to cognitive overload. It, working in Casa Grande, Arizona, hot as fuck. You know, I'm running three thermometers to keep track of, you know, uh, ground temperature, air temperature, and uh, what uh, globe bulb temperature to make sure that guys aren't, you know, fading on me. If they're fading, as a student, how can you absorb the information the instructor is giving you? You have to be aware of those external variables that are separate from um, the uh, intrinsic, extraneous um, uh, portions of cognitive overload uh, so that your student can absorb the information. That set so keep that in mind as an instructor or as a student. You know, hey, you know, you're a student in a class. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm fading here. I need to take a break. Okay, everybody. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing people are kind of drifting off or fading here. Let's take a, uh, a water, an extra water break. Pull all your gear off, down to your, you know, shirts. Sit down, drink some cold liquid. Uh, get some uh, lickies and chewies in you. Um, while we're doing that, you know, I'm available for questions. Let's do some Socratic stuff, you know, school circle, whatever, um, to give them that opportunity to um, recover physically. That being said, that's for grounding uh, fundamentals and um, uh, very uh, important initial skills. Once you've acquired those, however, going to what Chuck was saying, um, you have to get your students to understand the concept of the mind is primary, as Mark Twight would say, um, and learn to um, embrace the suck. Uh, it's like when I climb high in the mountains, it's a fucking suffer fest the entire goddamn time. There's nothing comfortable about it. And as Chuck was saying, you know, I pace myself from, you know, telephone pole to telephone pole. I pace myself from snow feature to rock outcrop to shadow point to whatever. I'm going to do, you know, rest steps so many times. And I'm going to do 10 normal steps till I get to that rock outcrop. And then I'm going to take a tea break and check my gear and, um, you know, kick the snow off my fucking crampons and check the radio and reinforce um, with everybody that they check their rope line and whatnot. So at some point when you become proficient or your students have become proficient, you have to push them into that red zone just a little bit to get them comfortable with being uncomfortable. And a lot of people that go to classes don't want that. You know, they want um, it's for them. It's a weekend with the boys. It's like a golf trip or a fishing trip. And, and, and I have no problem with that social concept of, you know, training and uh, as an instructor, that's bread and butter for a lot of us. But at the same time, when you're dealing with professionals, um, once they've acquired a competency level with the skills they need to have to do single tasks and then stack single tasks into multiple tasks or multitasking, um, you have to kind of push them over the edge and make them uncomfortable 
to the point where they become comfortable with being uncomfortable. They know it's going to suck. There's nothing they can do about it. They don't give a fuck. They have a, they have a job to do, you know, do work. You know, you clear a room. What's the next thing you got to look for? You know, are you covering the door? Are you checking the bodies? Are you checking each other? Are you checking your equipment? Always find something to do. But you can't get there, you know, you can't get your students there as an instructor until you've gotten them to the point where they're um, grounded in those singular tasks and, uh, and fundamentals. And you can combine those as like, a, as like a flow thing that Varg was talking about, doing a riff on a song, you know, you just kind of getting out there and playing the, the guitar um, and jamming. Um, that comes from, you know, doing a lot of, you know, uh, chords and keys and understanding the basics of what you're doing. But, but being able to suffer and being okay with that is something that a lot of instructors don't push their students to um, understand. And that's a failing as an instructor. I got something for that. Um, just real quick. <clears throat> when I was, when you guys were talking about that, you know, that failing point and the conservation of energy and, and the flow state, this whole thing, um, now people may, can understand guys that have heard me say this before. Like when I go to procedural level training or like CQB stuff like that, my personal primary objective is to get through the, the tasks effectively while maintaining uh, as close to a resting heart rate as possible the entire time. That's kind of a marker for me to be able to say, um, I'm accomplishing a higher level of achievement in that task, not, you know, not in an elevated state when I don't have to be. I'm conserving energy. I'm not cluttering up my processor with, uh, with the things that, that, you know, raise physiological and, and emotional um, uh, states. And, uh, and I'm, I'm able to, to last a lot longer or have a lot more for that burst if I ever need it. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there because that lined up with all that. Yeah, and that, that's what I wanted to get through because, I mean, we talked about you know, we, we, we have two hours of what cognitive overload is. So I wanted to get into, you know, those sort of things that we, we've just been talking about for probably 45 minutes now. Um, and and that's, what, that's what people need to understand, you know, when they listen to this stuff is because we've all either done this or we've worked with people who's done, done this. So. Joe's been working with the international sniper teams for freaking five years now, five, six years. Um, so he's seen these guys, how they perform to get all, all the results back from, from the stuff. Joe even goes down to Fort Benning with them and, and observes them during the competition. And yeah, competition is different than real world, but Joe's seen, you know, those guys do that stuff. He's got the background to do it. You know, all the rest of the rest of the panel members have, have been there, done that and had to figure it out the hard way. So if we can get stuff laid out for dudes to start poking at and learning it the easier way, then they're going to be farther along the path after they've been doing this for the same amount of time that we have than we are right now. So and, and that's just where I wanted to get get us to. And, and we went there in, in spades and it was good. And, and you, said you had to drop pretty soon. Yeah, guys, I gotta, I gotta drop. I'm done. Uh, so I gotta take care of some other stuff tonight before I go to bed. So it was good. This was a great panel. Uh, it was really cool being in on this. Thanks for bringing me in. Good to have you, Varg. Anytime. Likewise. Good deal. Thanks, Varg. Um, I was I was just going to say that uh, uh, some of this is learned behavior, um, especially when it comes to panic and other Im emotional responses. Uh, panic is contagious and so is calm. Uh, we talk about or, or in my circles, we talk about combat calm. Uh, I have seen and heard people whose 
calmness, whether it was reality or not, their the, the perception that they were putting out was that they were completely in control, and uh, it calmed down their subordinates that were looking for them for guidance and to be able to make decisions and and do whatever. You know, I, I just used the example of being a platoon sergeant during a, a casualty event. Um, I was uh, an OC for uh, the, the Rangers, a uh, different Ranger battalion, and I met uh, a guy that would grow up to be Sergeant Major Grippy. Uh, Grippy was the battalion CSM of one of the infantry battalions that flew into uh, t- um, that flew into Operation Anaconda, and he was wounded uh, right right on infill and had to deal with some mass cal issues. I met the guy when he was a company first sergeant, and his company attacked my uh, my objective, which was on uh, it was a hangar on Spokane Air Force Base, and uh, and his boys took a little bit of an ass whipping coming in, and they probably had I probably assessed somewhere between eight and eleven casualties with his company, and I watched this guy strut in, and he's in the middle of this hangar, and they're lining all the Rangers up, and he's got to decide. What, what chalks these guys came in on and what chalks they were going out on. And, like, Grippy never let any of that phase him. Um, I had had a guard that was watching the front of the hangar, and he had gotten shot, and he had knocked the table over. But Grippy, like, picked the folding table back up and, and scooted up to it in his chair and unloaded all of his notebooks and his leader books and shit, and he started working numbers on dust-offs and medevacs and everything just as calm as you could possibly be. Um, and, and I sat back as a, I think I was a junior E6 at the time. And I was like, man, that dude has got his shit together. And he just, his, his ability to just not let everything that was going on around him was, was pretty awesome. Uh, we had a klaxon like alarm bell. I mean, it was loud. Uh, and I had found where the switch was for this thing. And I told the op four, hey, when they attack, you need to hit the alarm bell. And it was so loud in there that you could not even conduct a face-to-face conversation with somebody else without screaming. And Grippy just, in, in, as a matter of fact, he just kind of turned to one of the Rangers that ran by. And he just kind of pulled the guy in. He said, hey, stud, find out where the switch for that alarm is and turn it off, please. Because he was just trying to clear his, clear his mind and get himself right to do whatever, you know. And that dude set an example for me in some bunk-ass training event in 1997 that would come back around when, when I was a platoon sergeant uh, dealing with the exact same bullshit later on. So, uh, you know, we talk about you can't teach mindset and, and whatever, but you can teach coping strategies. And you can absolutely set an example with how you conduct yourself under cognitive overload to prevent uh, from prevent that panic from from taking a hold and taking a grip uh, of of your people. And even something as simple as uh, working in a team and dynamic, like with snipers or whatever, how you address your teammate when you are stressed the fuck out, taking that extra time to take a deep breath and communicate effectively. Because if you're stressed out and physically privated, your partner's the same way. And if you call him a motherfucker for a bad win, win call, he is going to motherfuck you right back. Next thing you know, you're not trusting the information that you're putting out to each other and you have a dysfunctional team dynamic. And it all started because you were not willing to go. All right, man. I said, I said 0.5 left. Um, Roger that when he's, he's starting to freak out. Hey man, did you say left or right? said 0.5 left in a nice calm even tone it's going to set it's going to set the dynamic for everything that you two people are going to do together in that hole guys learn behavior and setting the example take a deep breath before you key the hand mic that kind of shit it's they're timeless lessons that all of us that had any decent leaders in the military taught us and the shit works and it's backed in this cognitive science crap that we've been talking about I also like to comment on Ash's um, comment about think about this as through trial and error. Now having the language, a lot of what I do is a lot of what we're talking about is 
instead of learning from trial by error, hand this information down to those so they don't have to go through that trial and error period so they can learn faster. Just because you had to learn it, quote unquote, the hard way, does that mean that that other person needs to? Yeah, it's a legacy that you're trying to push forward to people that aren't quite there. And a lot of people want to keep their stuff secret and they want to, you know, make it mysterious. Nah, man, you got a question for me why this works or why this doesn't work. I'm happy to share it, as is everybody here, um, because we don't want you to have to worry about that learning curve. We want to flatten out your learning curve so that the other skills you have to acquire, you can focus on those as opposed to, as Chuck was saying, I'm running dual comms. I did, you know, pigtails. I had two radios, one in each year. He learned that from somebody else who taught him, you know, or he learned that through trial and error and frustration. And so the next guy that comes along He's pointing that out to him. Hey, dude, focus on this. Do this. This will make your life easier. So when that person has to acquire a new skill, you know, or has to has to deal with another task in front of them, it's one less variable in the equation. And that, as in, as instructors and as this community, that's what we're trying to um, lay out for people and 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 hand uh, you so that uh, you're uh, able to um, do the new things without having to worry about. Uh, the minutia of um, your job. You agree, Joe? Yeah, definitely. Because sometimes I know in regards to sports psychology, everybody keeps a secret of what's going on. And it's like at certain points, it's, it can't be that it's got to um, go on. Why reinvent the wheel? It's like, pass it on. So because circumstances, Hey, in sports, yeah, it could be, you lose a game. The risk that you guys go through is, Hey, it's, it can be more than just losing a game. Well, if you look at Kale Sanderson, who's the coach, the wrestling coach at Penn state, uh, who's the most successful coach in modern coaching and one of the best wrestlers we've ever had, he has no qualms about sharing his knowledge. He invites other coaches in, they talk on the phone, they text each other, you know, he wants to grow the sport and make the sport better organically and comprehensively. He doesn't keep secrets, you know, he's like, hey, look, this is how we do this. This is why we do this. Here are our best practices. This is how we do nutrition. This is how we train. This is how I do recruiting. He wants to grow the sport. You know, he's not selfish. And 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 because of his attitude and his gift to the wrestling community as a coach, other coaches are able to grow their programs and increase, you know, the uh, visibility of the sport and whatnot. And when it comes to what we're doing, it's the same thing. I have to agree with that. And uh, to add to that, I think, and it's something as an industry and pretty much any, every industry deals with is that everyone wants to have their own secret sauce and I get it. You know, you're, you're running a company, you got to hang your own shingle. You got to stand out or make yourself different uh, than the next guy. But at the end of the day, the job of an instructor, any instructor, no matter, no matter what the task is, is to teach and to share information. And if you're not sharing that information, you're not instructing. In my opinion, you're hoarding information and no one, you don't get any more bonus points for hoarding information or, again, in this industry, convoluting information, why, you know, invent words or terms uh, or claim to invent something that's been around for decades, or there's an easier way to explain the concept. Sharing that information goes back to what was just said, is that that's how we prevent uh, people from making those same mistakes. And we can, again, compress that learn all that learning that we have as an individual or as a group uh, so the new guys, the young guys don't make these same type of mistakes. And, you know, personally, I always look at it. I will, if someone asks me about something, I will share the information with them. Uh, I, I, I constantly take in information. And of course I filter it through my, my, you know, years of experience. Cause a lot of it out there, you have to filter out the bullshit from the fact or the, someone's fucking trying to polish a turd and tell you it's something new and great 
yeah, you, you learn how to polish that stuff up, but the good stuff, you need to keep passing that on, no matter what it is. If it's underwater basket weaving, if it's learning how to shoot, you ha as instructors, we have to be able to pass it on. But we also have to be able to call bullshit and say, look, you're polishing a turd. You may think it's you're trying to set yourself apart or you're putting out some bad poop. That, you know, again, as an instructor, you need to be able to approach another instructor or uh, a thought process that some maybe a group think and say, look, this is not based in reality. Here's this is how shit works. And I think, again, sharing the information is the message that you never really hear people as instructors come out and say, let's share information. Now, everyone wants to share their concept and how they do things. But really, let's share our information with each other. Take what works for, you know, again, you and everyone else and how to, because I learn more uh, personally going to instructor courses. When was, it was, you know, driving instructors, shooting instructor courses. I learn more from watching other instructors and seeing what does work. And, you know, because I don't know how to explain everything a certain way that some, every other person might get. So I learn more as an instructor watching other instructors teach and talking to them uh, and how to gain useful information, how to, again, share that information or present it in a different way so that person understands uh, what the, you know, the message I'm trying to give them because they may not understand it in my preferred method of explaining it. And I can pick that up through feedback, watching them. And then again, if like, well, you know, approach A is not working, I'm going to go through approach B because I saw, you know, I remember back when Jerry Barnhart told me how to do this. And I remember it and I can use that as another another approach or course of action. And that's one guy I'll, I'll give mad props to is like from an instructor standpoint, having spent time up at him, that dude, like everyone goes to a shooting course to think, oh, I'm going to learn how to shoot and I'm going to shoot these drills. I learned more about just being an instructor and how to approach uh, problem solving for shooters by watching him help other people in my class in the group that we're in showing them how to, how to tweak things and how he approached things, which is very methodical. And from him, I learned more of this. It's nothing like a light bulb popping. It was small things that came to teaching, you know, a teaching uh, ability that I already had, but it was the small little tips or tricks that he had learned through, through his experience that he was able to pass on to not only myself, but the group that I thought were like invaluable. And again, it's, instructors should help other instructors out because we're in front of the students you hear stuff from students sometimes it causes you to think and you got to share that knowledge just just to piggyback off that for just a second this will be brief is that sometimes uh with a group of students or an individual student as an instructor you're not making any progress you know the light bulb's not coming on or they're not set to receive or whatever the problem is if you have a good training cadre Sometimes it's smart to get the task accomplished as far as getting them to acquire the skills is to trade instructors. You know, there's, there's no, you should be humble enough as an instructor to say, I can't get through to student number two on relay three. Um, hey, Bob or Scott, you know, to, to piggyback off you. Hey, Scott, go up to student number two on relay three. Uh, he, he can't get what I'm saying. Maybe you can present it in a different way. And, it'll click. Um, but a lot of instructors are not willing to give up their vanity um, and they're full of hubris and they're not willing to step aside to let somebody else try to get the student on board with what they're doing or help them, you know, acquire that skill. So, you know, as instructors don't feel that you have to be right all the time and don't feel uncomfortable or um, that you're not, um, perfect all the time because sometimes you have to be willing to step aside to let another instructor step in because our teaching styles may be different or their learning capabilities and styles may be different that's all i want to say about that when i think that just kind of ties into you know the the overall methodology of how we we share the information bringing that back up you know it also goes back into how do we get those best practices. And I think that was one of the best things that Ash did with the whole rewrite of the dot nine was he didn't just sit there and say, Hey, I'm going to fucking write the book myself. No, he fucking resourced it out to a broad audience of vetted people to sit there and try and get the most feedback and not necessarily 
everybody agreed with the way the book was written, but you know what? It was a much better product overall because of it, because of all those diverse viewpoints coming in and making a much better book um, to start a foundational document. And I think that when we share the information, what we as a collective group get as a result is a much stronger product than you know the the sum of its individual components what does the group think on that oh yeah that's, definitely so uh just jump on you real quick scott the what we tried to do with the book what the what the ultimate thing was that we wanted to do was we wanted to get people as they were learning shooting we wanted to get them onto something that was able to translate into all the stuff that we've been talking about all night. Um, if you look at the, um, like the, some of the stuff that, that Joe has, basically it goes, it goes down a flow, it goes down a process. So we turned all the shots. We, you know, we made basically made that the standard was the process. Um, rather than, you know, the way we were pitching it, it was just, we just changed how we were pitching the information and we we're trying to get it to where it would, would work out better. Um, as people got to here, cause here's where we wanted them to be in six, five, six years down the road. Once they've heard the resiliency stuff and they've heard the sports psychology stuff and they you know, they start hearing this, like Joe's giving the class at Fort drum and the guy has been reading in the book and he's just like, Oh, all this shit makes sense. Cause it's in this book. It's been in this book the whole time. And, and that's where we wanted to get to. Um, and, you know, it, it worked out well, worked out pretty good. And Joe's able to use that stuff in, in his things. But I just want to hit on um, the resiliency piece. And we, we've said the word a few times, and that's that's where really what Joe's getting paid to do right now is resiliency type stuff. But I just want to, want to talk about this match that I just shot. Um, basically, day one, and it'll be a long story short. Day one was 10 stages of getting kicked in the nuts and reacting the best way possible. It, it was just miserable. The targets were tiny. They were far away. Wind was shifty. Uh, positions were fucking uber weird. It was just, it, it became a question of who sucked the least, not who was shooting the best. I mean, in, in a way, it was who shooting the best, but it became who sucked the least. So with the resiliency and, and my squad was pretty good, but everybody was frustrated. Everybody, even, even, even the great Tyler Payne was frustrated after day one, but each stage you had to go and you had to shoot that stage the best that you could, because that was a competition, but we watched some guys auger in. And once they got, once they stacked up that first, 1500 seconds in, in penalties, 30 seconds at a time. These are just not shooting well. Um, so in that, in that competition in fucking combat in reality, you have each event, you have to be able to give that hundred percent for you have to be able to control yourself, be resilient for it and get back into what needs to be done. Because if you get down in a hole or you get too cocky or you can't control where you are, you need to maintain that level. If you can't control that, you're going to fuck up either by thinking that you're better than you are or thinking that you suck more than you do. So you have to bring that up each and each and every part. You know, a firefight that lasts four hours isn't four hours of shooting guns. Nobody has a, that many bullets just to be shooting guns for four hours. So there's lulls and there's movements and you're doing things. Sometimes those things will work. Sometimes those things don't work and um, on both sides. So you need to be able to be like, well, fuck that one up, moving on. Uh, and the, that, that resiliency side, the way to get yourself back into, like we hit tonight, the way to get yourself back into where you need to be with your, you know, if you want to call it performance zone or where you feel right or whatever. Uh, but you need, you need to be able to control that because if you don't, whether it's competition or whether it's combat, you're going to start getting into bad spots. And the, uh, the way I, I just happened to roll off, it was uh, every stage is a chance for greatness. So if you shot the last stage shitty, the next stage that you go to, you might be able to shoot that one good. 
if you can control yourself. And that that's just the one of the one of the harder things to learn. Uh, um, I think you kind of want to be there before you deploy. But that that's just something that's recent that you know you know I've seen Joe a couple times and it's twenty a couple times been at Fort Benning and stuff like that. Nancy stuff was right there with me during that match. I appreciate you. Thanks for your stuff. <laughs> Thanks for putting up with the uh, fire and brimstone mindset classes. I, I kind of miss them now. Um, but yeah, for that resilience side, it re really is judgmental because the question is once that round leaves the rifle, do you have any control over it? And it's like, no. And there's a time and place to analyze what's going on, but having that time and place might not be right now. And to go, hey, how do I get down to the next shot? Every ch shot is a chance for greatness, like you said, Ash. It's like refocusing that mind. It's, it's telling you time because thinking about a past shot and one foot in the present, what you're, or one foot in the future, Guess what you're doing? You're pissing on the present. And that's the only part part you have to make any effect. And like and so I think the first I uh, did some training at I heard uh, hey I'm here to get home. And it's like that's putting yourself in that mindset of what you're going to do. Suck. make it bad term how do you make it suck less and get through it because it's your mind that's going to let you down first unless you make it your best friend by training it by with those thoughts and it's also could be that segmenting down of going what's the next telephone post what's the next telephone post what's the next target and continue going on that way that's definitely that's that mental side I agree completely with that. And I think, uh, you know, I, I've seen instances where dudes let their mind and for some, you know, I'm sure a good deal part of their ego get in front of uh, their ability to, to complete something. You know, I, I can think of a couple of times uh, I've seen dudes in SFAS selection quit they they just you know and of course they rationalized why they wanted to quit they weren't physically uh incapable of doing it but they were thinking about other things like hey fuck this man i got a job as a squad leader back at fucking battalion um and you know i don't have to do this shit and i'm not gonna do it and they, they you know they had defeated themselves in their mind and they hadn't pushed themselves beyond that limit. it's not that they weren't capable of but they found they weren't like you said they were living in the future they weren't living in the present and dealing with what they had to deal with right then and there. And that's, and then they fucking, they're the, they defeated themselves. They're their worst enemy. And that's the whole, the whole concept, you know, kind of go back to that, you know, spiritual, you know, philosophy stuff is you got to quiet the mind. Your, that voice in your head is the motherfucker who will talk you into more bad situations or talk you into quitting than any deed standing to your left or right. That voice, cause it never shuts the fuck up. Even when you're, you know, like you're, you're sit down for a second and there's that voice. Hey, man, you know, I should fucking do this or I shouldn't do that. That little voice is always fucking with you. Um, and we're our worst enemies on that. But calming that voice down and, you know, quieting your mind, finding that that equilibrium. Again, that's the hardest part. It's different for everybody. But that's the, in my opinion, that's the key to to success you know like you said you got to learn to embrace the suck you got to hang the you know like chuck was talking about with the telephone poles you got to put the carrot on the stick in front of yourself to push yourself uh and trick your mind uh as well because you'll keep going man you you know your your mind will give out before your body does in most cases unless you like have bones sticking out of shit or something like that but i've even seen dudes with broken bones fucking continue to walk fucking in incredible amounts of miles so i mean you know the mind's in the body and if the physical wills there you can do a lot of shit yeah you you have to know when you're going down uh 
when you're spiraling down in, in, into, into the dark place and you've got to be able to self self diagnose that and turn it around. Like Ash is saying, there are guys that, all right, they screwed up a shot. Then that turned into screwing up a stage. Then that turned into going to the next stage and they're all fucked up and, and blah, blah, blah. Like, I had the unfortunate experience of being in a hallway on some graded evolutions in a shoot house and watch somebody implode and implode to the point that it affected the next 15 years of their army career. I saw it happen in real time. I saw someone get corrected. And as a result of the panic of getting corrected, compound error after error after error and every time he was corrected caused more sheer panic in this individual and uh like done done fired gone in in from from a single bad decision that would have been nothing. I mean, when I say nothing, it would have just been noted and it would have gone into a whole nother list of bad decisions that you make that comes up at the end to be the subjective dis- uh, decision on whether or not uh, you're, you're the right person. And, and they, how they chose to react to that one mistake ended up in them spiraling out of control into into self-destruction right in front of me in real time and it was horrific to watch it was absolutely horrific to watch to know that this person's life dreams everything they wanted everything that the pinnacle of their existence they were never ever ever going to achieve it uh out of one afternoon's uh uh, bad, bad, bad decisions coupled with, uh, with just sheer panic. Um, a flip side to that is that you can, you can correct yourself. So, uh, up on the battle, uh, up on Roberts Ridge, the battle of Takargar, uh, there was a casualty that was lost while, uh, medical personnel were working on him. And, uh, after the casualty expired, uh, w- one of the medics that was working on him, who personally knew the individual that died, um, lost his temper. He was mad. Dustoff wasn't there. Uh, why didn't it come? This is bullshit. And he kicked uh, his aid bag over and all of the contents spilled out in the snow. And another medic who had been shot in the gut was laying with the rest of the casualties in the CCP. And he was conscious, and he yelled down the line to the medic, and he said, hey, man, you lost one. There are six of us over here, and I can't help myself. I am shot in the gut, and I need you to get back in the fight and treat us. And as fast as that medical person lost his temper, he picked up his rolls of Curlex and shit out of the snow, dusted them off, put them back in his aid bag, and he went back to work. Uh, and it was just a, a totally, a totally reasonable emotional response. When you go through six months of medical training with somebody, and they die as your patient, you, you're going to have some, you're going to have some issues, right? Uh, but his ability to be talked to by another and and the crazy like talk about moon and stars aligning. How in the hell do you get three medical people that were all in the same medical course, all on a mountain at the same time. And two of them are shot. Uh, I I don't know, but, uh, but it happened. And, uh, and from three different military units, but they all coalesced uh, and they found themselves on the battlefield together. And at the end of it, only one of the three people that went through the medical course was unwounded at the end of that engagement. And it was these personal relationships that caused the stress were the same personal relationships that pulled this guy back out, you know, and if any of you guys have ever heard or read about 
SEER school and resistance training. And when people are broken by the enemy, you have to bring them back into the fold. Uh, it's the inclusion of the group that allows somebody to, 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 to bounce back after, after they failed because you don't want them to be broken and then be an open book. You want the enemy to have to work for that shit the next time. So that guy has got to be able to rebuild something to have a defense to resist, to be resilient uh, the next time that, that it comes on. And, and part of that process of, uh, of getting those guys back and getting their heads back right is this, in, is this inclusion piece of your mates uh, helping you out. But like I said, I have seen, I have seen dudes fail and and have that failure fucking throw them off into the abyss and i've seen dudes and i won't even say fail have negative shit happen to them that they decided to blame themselves for situations that are physiologically out of their fucking control uh but that they chose to internalize and and, uh, and assess assign self-blame over and they were able to bounce back and uh and continue to be productive and finish the fight so that that's my two little anecdotes there Nice. And I think with that, I'm going to get off here. Got to get up and uh, prep for Fort Benning next week. Yay. Yeah, been good to go. In the Georgia area, got a precision or, yeah, precision expo, some shit at a arena training group or training facility in Blakely, Georgia. If you haven't shot at arena yet, you need to. Some people used to shoot there when it was called Legion. It's not there anymore. Or Legion's not, it's not Legion anymore. It's a uh, rebuilt and much better off. You can still shoot out farther than most guns are capable of doing that, that we know about anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, good panel tonight. Good stuff. I, th I think this one will be probably one of our, uh, yeah, Precision Rifle Expo is what it's called. I think this one will be probably one of our least watched but it'll probably be one of the, the, the people gain the most from that do watch it because it's all sciencey and nerdy. And I appreciate that guys. <laughs> right on, man. Same here. <laughs> so I'm going to sign off too. Got to get up yeah. in the morning and go to work. <laughs> I appreciate you guys taking the time to come on the panel. This is uh, this powerful stuff. Right on brother. I got to take off myself. Y'all have a good one. Yeah, you Later. too, buddy. You do. Yeah. Uh, big thanks to Facts on Firearms. Uh, go to factsonfirearms.com. Find some really good Air 15 parts, some barrels, pistol barrels. Big thank you to uh, Filster. They make some really cool stuff. Uh, very innovative um, systems. I just ordered a Flex just recently. Um, their holsters are uh, they're very streamlined, very well thought up thought out uh john is an artist and he's a designer and he's very talented his low profile medical kits are very nice and definitely need to be checked out um big thank you to patreon subscribers um without your support we wouldn't be able to do this on a regular basis and we wouldn't have these resources um your support makes this helps this happen uh, there's a lot going on with primary and secondary. Um, you can find us at primaryandsecondary.com. We have a forum at primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. If you log into the forum and you have an account, then you get access to our Discord server. On Discord, that is... So let's see here. If, if we have uh, We have three levels of depth and speed. The slowest and the most deep conversation is on the forum. If we go in the middle, middle ground, that's Facebook. People provide a little bit more information. The speed is about medium. The most shallow discussion that goes by super fast is on Discord. That's just quick, quick discussions. Uh, good stuff, and it's always moving. If you happen to be a Patreon subscriber, you have even more access on the Discord server. Every single topic you can think of, we actually cover it in Discord, just like the Facebook groups. Um, think of it like a big old school forum, and it starts to make a lot more sense. Uh, yeah, so... If you like what you heard, if you learned anything, make sure you hit like, make sure you hit subscribe and definitely share. That sharing really helps us out. 
Um, this also kind of gives me an idea of what material we need to do later on. So there's a, there's a possibility we may have more episodes like this with this episode, with this topic, if we get enough feedback about it. So that's important. Also make sure you comment. We do have a Vimeo channel. We are on YouTube. We're on iTunes, Spreaker. Uh, let's see here. What else? Spotify, iHeartRadio, and we're all over the place. Next week, expect another live show on Thursday, 1800 hours. And as, as, per, the, as per the norm, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do, but it's going to be a good episode. So expect a good episode. So that's it. We'll talk to you guys later.